Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. This is our weekend exam cram for the Microsoft Certificate AZ900. The objective of this exam cram is to prepare you for one of the most important foundation Azure Certificate AZ900 during this weekend so that you look forward to pass the certification in coming days. The video is divided into 13 parts, 11 regular part and 2 bonus parts. Each part has a set of question and answer with detailed justification for each answer. Every answer is supported by suitable Microsoft documentation. Not only that, each part is full of tips, tricks and cross references that will not only ensure that you get high scores in AZ900 certificate, but also prepare you with basic cloud understanding so that you can get started as a cloud professional post completing this exam cram. This is going to be a long session, so feel free to pause the video wherever you want, take a break, have a cup of coffee or tea, stretch yourself and enjoy the session. To help you learn in the offline mode as well, there is a mega giveaway in our this weekend exam cram for AZ900. I will give a PDF version of all 191 questions to the viewers who give me the correct answer for the following questions. You have to tell me what was the answer for question number 3, question number 17, 31, 51, 63, 81, question number 100, then question number 123, 168 and lastly 191. So let's begin with our first question on AZ900 real exam question series. So let's read out the question. The question says that your company's developer intend to deploy a large number of custom virtual machines on a weekly basis. They will also be removing these virtual machines during the same week it was deployed. 60% of the virtual machines have Windows Server 2016 installed, while the other 40% has Ubuntu Linux installed. You are required to make sure that administrative effort needed for this process is reduced by employing a suitable Azure service. Now the solution that is given is that you recommended the use of Azure Virtual Reserve Virtual Machines instances. Does this solution meet the goal? So what you actually need to do is you need to read out the solution and you need to think that whether in this case Azure Reserve Virtual Machine will solve this business case. So now let's look at the question once again. It says that the custom virtual machines will be deployed on a weekly basis and they will also be removed in the same week they will be deployed. So what do you imply from this? The implication of this or the meaning of this is that virtual machines are there for a very short span of life. They are not there sitting for one year or two years or a longer period of time. It's just a week time that these virtual machines will be used for. Now let me tell you what is the actual meaning or use of Azure Reserve Virtual Machines before we can see the answer. So the Azure Reserve Virtual Machines are primarily used when you want to, uh, when you need a virtual machine for a longer period of time. So let's say you already know that you would need a virtual machine for a year or two or three years, then you reserve that virtual machine. You pay for that machine or reserve that machine upfront and then you save a huge money. Microsoft gives you good discount when you reserve some virtual machine for a longer horizon of time. But in this case, the virtual machines are there only for a week. Thus, the answer for this is definitely not Azure Reserve Virtual Machine. So you need to think something else for this. Definitely not this one. So the answer is a no. Now let's look at our second question. Our second question says that your company developer intend to deploy a large number of custom virtual machine on a weekly base. I think you can already make out that this question is an re exact replica of this question. However, the solution is different. So let's read out. So then further it says that they will also be removing these virtual machine on a weekly base and 60% of the virtual machines have Windows Server and 40% have Ubuntu Linux. Now this time 
The solution is that you recommended the use of Azure Dev Test Labs. So does this solution meet the goal? Let me tell you more about Azure Dev Test Lab and then we will look upon the solution. So guys, Azure Dev Test Lab enables you to quickly provision environments using reusable templates and artifacts. Also, it gives developers and testers a self-service sandbox type of environment to quickly provision dev environments or test environments. So now you can see that we are already talking about the solution of Dev Test Lab and its ability to provision the environments very quick. And that's what it is actually needed in this. Okay, so now before I can give you the final answer, let me take you to the Microsoft site. Now here on this page, so it says what Azure Dev Test Lab is, what is its cost and governance and how it enables you to quickly provision the environments. So I would encourage you to come on to this page and then you can read a lot about Azure Dev Test Lab and how does it help you to quickly provision these kind of environments. Just to take you through, it gives you already that you can use ARM templates to quickly provision the environments. And then it says that quickly create Windows and Linux environment by using reusable templates and artifacts. And that's exactly what the need of this question is. I will give all the links that we will describe or discuss within this first uh, part of Azure 900 question series in the description box. So you don't need to worry or note down the links here now. Just go to the description box whenever you see the video and you will find everything there. So now let's look at the correct answer. So our correct answer for this question has to be a yes. So Azure Dev Test Lab does solve this business case. So now let's move to our third question. Our third question says that your company has virtual machines hosted in Microsoft Azure. The virtual machines are located in a single Azure virtual network called VNet1. The company has users that work remotely. The remote workers require access to VM on VNet1 you need to provide access to remote workers. What should you use? So should you use or configure, configure a site-to-site -site VPN or configure a VNet-to-VNet -VNet VPN? The third option is point-to-site VPN or should you configure direct access on Windows Server 2012 Server Virtual Machine? Or the last option is configure a multi-site VPN. Let me take you to the Microsoft site and then we will come back and answer this question. Before that, just observe some of the keywords and then we will dive into the Microsoft site. The keywords here are that the company user has to work remotely. So keep that in mind. And the remote workers require access on virtual machines on VNet1. Now let's jump. So now here is a page from Microsoft that discuss and describes how you can design different gateways and different connections. Uh, so either you can use site to site or you can use the other option, for example, point to site VPN. So let's read out and figure out and try to figure out what could be the correct option for this question. S2S connection can be used for cross-premise and hybrid configuration. A S2S connection requires a VPN device to be located on premise that has a public IP address assigned to it. Now, if you remember, our requirement is something different. What we need to do is that our workers access to the virtual machine on a VNet from a remote location. So this doesn't quite fit these requirements. So let's move on. Now let's come to point to site VPN. The point to site VPN gateway connection lets you create a secure connection to your virtual network from an individual 
client computer. Now you can read more about this. However, the area where I want you to focus is. So this one says that this solution is useful for telecommuters who want to connect Azure VNet from a remote location such as home or a conference. I hope you can already relate this line with what we read in the question. And this is what our question also demands that we need to connect. Our user needs to connect over a remote location. So this looks like a correct answer. I would encourage you to come on this page and look at the details of setting up different sort of uh, gateway designs. Okay. So our correct answer for this question is configure a point to site VPN. Also, there is a very good information given in Microsoft documentation. So there is another page here which says which gives you a lot of information about uh, point to site VPN, how to use it, what protocol it has. And then there is one third uh, page that I have figured out uh, from Microsoft is it actually takes you through all the steps on how can you configure a point to site, right? So you can come on to this page and it has all the steps configuration that you might need to do, uh, how to create a VNet over in the Azure portal and lot of other details. It's a very good page and it's almost like a, you know, an exercise for you that you can do and practice to set up all these kind of different uh, gateways. Okay, so now let's come back to our slide and move to question number four. Our question number four says that you have been informed by your superiors of the company intentions to automate server deployment to Azure. There is, however, some concern that administrative credentials could be uncovered during this process. You are required to make sure that during the process of deployment, the administrative credentials are encrypted using a suitable Azure solution. So what is the solution given? The solution given here is that you recommend the use of Azure information protection. So does Azure information protection solve or take care of this concern raised by the uh, authorities or the management that administrative credentials should not be uncovered. Okay, so let's figure out and understand first about Azure information protection and then we will try to solve this question. So now let me give you more information about Azure Information Protection. So Azure Information Protection or AIP is a cloud-based solution that enables organizations to discover, classify and protect document and emails by applying labels to it. However, the main task or ask in this question is to encrypt, right? So if you see the question very carefully, that it asks that you need to encrypt the administrative credentials. So uh, going by the definition of Azure Information Protection, this will not fit here. Just to give you an idea, the solution had it been uh, Azure Key Vault, then it would have been a good solution or a right solution, so to say. But for now, our option was Azure Information Protection. Thus, the correct answer for this question is a no. Now let's move on to the question number five. The question says that your developers have created 10 web applications that must be host on Azure. You need to determine which Azure web tier plan to host the web apps. The web app tier must meet the following requirement. So the first requirement is the web apps will use custom domains. The web apps each require 10 GB of storage. The web apps must each run in a dedicated compute instance. Load balancing between instances must be included and the cost must be minimized. 
So which web tier plan should you use? Let me take you to the Microsoft site. Now, this is the page on which Microsoft has very clearly uh, explained about the various app service pricing. So if you scroll down a little, here you can see the various pricing models or the various pricing tiers. So the pricing tiers that we have are free, shared, basic, standard, premium, and isolated. Now, the requirements that we had in our question was, I will keep the requirements here. Okay, so in order to ease out uh, this understanding, I will keep the requirements here uh, in a notepad so that we can match off the requirement with that of these different app plans. So let me squeeze this a little. Yes. Okay. So now I hope you can see the requirements clearly. If not, maybe I can zoom in a little. Okay. So now you can see the first requirement says that all the web apps should use custom domains. Now look at these uh, web plans. Now here, if you see, this is custom domain. So you can clearly see that the free tier plan does not support the custom domain. However, shared and basic and standard, and of course, premium and isolated, all of each, all of them support the custom domain uh, support. So uh, now we know that, of course, free is now removed. Uh, that one is not fitting the requirement. We have these four or five options that can still fit into our requirements. Let's move on. The other requirement is that 10 GB of storage. So each web app will require 10 GB of storage. And if you remember the question very carefully, it said that we have 10 web apps and each of them would require 10 GB. So now ideally, uh, how much would be the space need? You would actually need 10 GB and each each web app would need 10. So 10 into 10, the requirement for the storage is 100 GB here. Okay, so keep that in mind because that actually confuses uh, a lot of people and uh, a lot of sites have explained it uh, in their own manner. And I will explain why I have picked the answer, which I will show, which I will pick uh, ahead in the video. So keep that in mind. So the requirement that we need here is I will just mention it here is 100 GB. Moving on, the web app must uh, run in dedicated compute space. Okay, uh, so all of these except for free suits this requirement. The fourth point is load balancing between instance must be included. Now, if you will scroll down through the page, that then you would be able to see that load balancing is actually built in. So mostly all the plans except for the free plan supports load balancing. So you can see it here, build in load balancing and probably here also you can see build in load balancing. So almost all the plans except for free support load balancing. Now it also says that the cost must be minimized. Okay, so now that you have seen all of them, uh, one by one and the requirement and we have kind of matched the requirement uh, with these tier plans um, Now let's go back to the question, but 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 before that I just want to update a couple of things more here on this page um, Some of them are whenever you get the question, please read it very carefully is the question talking about Windows machine or is it talking about Linux machines because if you see here there are two sort of plans, Windows and Linux. Currently, we are on Windows. So be very careful in case there is no mention of the uh, type of operating systems, then you can uh, safely assume it's about Windows. Okay, so be very careful when you read the question. And because there are subtle differences between uh, Windows and Linux uh, plans. So just be thoughtful on that. Okay. And Besides that, you can see there is one more uh, very good link provided here. View full details for the web 
service plans. So if you open this page, this page will open uh, and here you can read it uh, more, more of the information is actually provided here on this page. So it's a very good page uh, to understand what are the nitty gritties of different plans. So come over. So come over to this page and have a look uh, before and then you will uh, and then you will understand these plans in a better way. Okay, so and now let's move on to our PPT once again. So we have uh, different plans. The first one is basic. The second one is developer. Then we have free and we have then standard. The correct answer for this, which I have chosen is standard. Now you might ask why I have not chosen the basic because the requirement for the storage would exceed the basic one. So you can see basic can only support 10 GB and uh, standard can support 50 GB. Now you might also ask that why uh, standard because standard only supports 50 and we calculated the requirements as 100 GB. So the answer for this one or the logic for this one would be that in our options, we only have standard as the maximum tier where we can go. We are not provided with premium or isolated. Plus there is an important uh, requirement which says cost must be minimized. That's the logic why I have chosen standard instead of basic. One very tricky thing is that sometimes Microsoft will try to confuse with, you know, wrong options as well. So for example, you can see developer option here. However, if you see on the pages of Microsoft, there is no mention of developer option. You can see here and you can see here as well. Where was it? Here. So here also you don't see any developer price tier option. So be very careful when you read the options. So the correct answer is standard. Let's move ahead with our question number six. The question number six says that you are planning to migrate a company to Azure. Each of the company as numerous divisions will have an administrator in place to manage the Azure resource used by their respective division. You want to make sure that the Azure deployment you employ allows, the, allows for Azure to be segmented for divisions while keeping the administrative effort to a minimum. And what's the solution given? The solution is that you plan to make use of several Azure Active Directory, Azure AD directories. Does this solution meet the goal? So now let's think uh, if this Azure Active Directory suits this requirement or not. So now let's first understand what is Azure Active Directory. So Azure Active Directory is a mean or some sort of facility that actually provides you uh, to contain users and groups. However, in this question, it asks you uh, that you need something to manage Azure resources. Thus, Azure Active Directory will not suit this requirement. So the answer for this question is now let's move on to our question number seven. Our question number seven is again kind of similar to the question number five. So it is also related to the pricing tier. So the question says that your developers have created a portal, a web app for users in Miami branch. The web app will be publicly accessible and used by Miami users to retrieve customer and product information. The web app is currently running in an on-premises test environment. You plan to host the web app on Azure. You need to determine which Azure web tier plan to host web app. The web app tier must meet following requirement. The first one is the web app will use Miami dot vlan dot com URL, which actually means what a custom URL. The website will be deployed to two instances. SSL support must be included. The website requires 12 GB of storage and the cost must be minimized. Which web tier plan should you use? 
So now, as we walk through the different plans in the previous question number five as well, I can tell the keywords here are custom uh, domain, which is here, Miami wayland.com so they can give these kind of you know uh, inputs or hints in different panel so here they clearly mentioned out it's a custom domain however they are here giving a url or a web website a location so you can on, so you need to understand both of these things are same then the other keyword that you might that you need to catch is that there are two instances and then another one is that this 12 GB of space. So these are the keywords that you need to catch when you read such kind of questions. So the answer for this question would be standard again. So if you go back to the to the URL that I showed you uh, while we were talking about question number five, then you can make out the best fit for this question would be a standard app. So now let's check out our question number eight. The question number eight says that you are required to deploy an artificial intelligence AI solution in Azure. You want to make sure that you are able to build, test and deploy predictive analytics for the solution. The solution for this is that you should make use of Azure Machine Learning Studio. So do you think that Azure Machine Learning Studio would fit this requirement? So let's check out what is Azure Machine Learning Studio. So the Azure Machine Learning Studio is a drag and drop tool that you can use to build, test, deploy predictive analytics solution. After reading this definition, I think I don't need to explain it further. You can clearly match the word by word of this definition with the requirement given in the question. So answer to this question is a sure shot. Yes. The question number nine is very similar to this one. So this is again that you are deploying an artificial intelligence in Azure and you should be able to build, test, deploy predictive analytics for the solution. So exactly the same question. However, this time the solution given is a little different. The solution says that this time you want to make use of Azure Cosmos DB. So does this meet the goal or not? Now, before answering, let's look at what is Azure Cosmos DB. <clears throat> now, Azure Cosmos DB is a fully managed NoSQL database for modern app deployment, development, sorry, single digit millisecond response times and automatic instant scalability guaranteed speed at any scale. Now, what are the keywords here in the definition? So the keyword is that Azure Cosmos DB is a fully managed NoSQL database. However, the need for you is to deploy an artificial intelligence solution where you can be able to deploy, <clears throat> build, test, predictive analytics solution. So this one, the Cosmos DB does not fit uh, the question because it has nothing to do with artificial intelligence. So the answer for this question is a no. Now let's move to our question number 10. So the question number 10 says that the company would like to develop a cloud solution by making use of Azure government. <clears throat> Azure government can only be used by a certain type of clients to develop cloud solution. Which of the following are type of customers that can make use of government in this situation? Answer by dragging the correct option from the list to the answer area. So in these kind of questions, you will be given many options here and then you have to actually drag these boxes onto this uh, surface, which is marked by answers. So let's check out what is Azure government and which entities come 
inside or which entities are part of Azure government. So here is the page where Microsoft gives a detailed documentation about Azure government. You can read this page, a uh, very helpful video here. Uh, and you can also understand what are the core components or entities which are part of Azure government. So if you will read out this page, you will see it basically talks about US government. So everywhere it's US entities. Uh, here also you can see it's mentioned that the US government, US government. So everywhere it talks about the US government uh, in this page. And then you can read, uh, and then you can come on this page as well, where you get a lot of other information. What are the Department of Defense, Intelligence Community, and a lot of other information if you are actually interested to know and type deep into this Azure government. So uh, now gaining this information from this documentation of Azure, now coming back to our slide, the correct answer for this question number 10 would be a United States government contractor and United States government entity. As we saw, it only talks about the US, United States, Thus, we will rule out any other country or European government contractor or entities. So, finalizing answer is United States. If any one of you is also interested in DP900 exam question and answer series, then I have created a series already for you. It has in total seven major parts and one weekend exam cram. In this series, it will take you through all the questions that you will need to know to clear the exam DP900. In addition to this, it will also make you understand what is DP900, who should do it and various other important questions like how to schedule DP900 and how to attain a free voucher. Yes, a free voucher. It's actually a free voucher from Microsoft itself. So don't forget to miss out this series and make best use of it. I recommend you to watch this playlist or this video. This video summarizes my previous playlist on Azure and will help you understand and answer the questions like how to start learning Azure, how much it costs or what is Azure free tier and how to create a free Azure account. I have explained the detailed process to create a free Azure tier account in these videos. So do check out them. In part two, I have also explained what are the features of Azure free account and what happens when the free subscription ends. Because this is one question that many people ask me that what happens when their free subscription end? How do they pay? How is their credit card charged? And lot of other questions. So do check out this video. It will help answer all of those questions. Also, I have given a real Azure billing sample, the real bill that I, I get when I practice Azure or do work in Azure. So this will help you understand how the actual Azure billing works. Then I have also shown some of the very valuable online resources and books that you can take into consideration while you prepare for AZ-900 or Azure in general. For now, let's straight away jump into the part two of our AZ-900 real exam question and answer series and start with the question number 11. <music> Question number 11 says that your company is planning to migrate all their virtual machines to an Azure pay as you go subscription. The virtual machines are currently hosted on the Hyper-V hosts in a data center. You are required to make sure that the intended Azure solution uses the correct expenditure model. The solution given is that you recommended the use of elastic expenditure model. Does this solution meet the goal? To tell you more about the uh, expenditure model, there are two kinds of expenditure model. One is capital expenditure that is also known as CAPEX and the other one is operational expenditure also known as OPEX. 
However, in the question, it asks about elastic expenditure model. Now, we don't have anything which is called elastic expenditure model. So the answer for this one is a no. Also, to give you more insights, so for example, let's say you get an option between uh, operational or capex expenditure model, then what will you choose? In that case, you have to choose operational model. Why? Because currently the virtual machines are hosted on a Hyper-V host in a data center. So I assume that this data center is an on-prem and now you are moving to Azure solution. So you will be incurring the cost on these virtual machine as and when you use it or the period for which you use the virtual machines. The longer the period, the longer you pay or higher you pay. So thus, this is an operational model and not capital expenditure. If you want to learn more about capital expenditure versus operational expenditure, then do check out this video. Question number 12 says that your company's infrastructure includes a number of business units that each needs a large number of various Azure resources for everyday operation. The resources required by each business unit are identical. You are required to sanction a strategy to create Azure resources automatically. The solution that you suggested is Azure API management service be included in the strategy. Do you think that this one meet the goal? Do you think Azure API management service meet the goal of deploying the resources automatically? So let me tell you a little more about Azure API management service. Azure API management service or APIM is a way to create manage is a way to create and manage custom API for existing backend services. However, in this question, that is not the ask. The question is asking you to give a strategy which will create Azure resource automatically. So the best resource or best tool to do this activity is Azure Resource Manager or popularly known as ARM. So ARM is the tool that gives you ability to automatically deploy resources on Azure. So the correct answer for this one is a no. Moving on with our question number 13. The question says that your company's Active Directory Forest includes thousands of user accounts. You have been informed that all network resources will be migrated to Azure. Therefore, the on-premises data center will be retired. You are required to employ a strategy that reduces the effect on users once the planned migration has been completed. Solution is you plan to sync all Active Directory user accounts to Azure Active Directory or Azure AD. Does this solution meet the goal? So let me tell you one thing. See, syncing all the Active Directory user account to Azure Active Directory is the best thing. Why? Because this will sync all the users to Azure Active Directory, right? And the users will not even know this. So it's, it, it is something that happens, but the users, the affected, the end users won't even notice. They won't even notice that the on-premise server, which was earlier managing the active directory is gone. Thus, this will eventually reduce the impact on user or the effect on user and that's exactly what the ask of the question is that you have to reduce the effect on the users so this is the best approach to sync all your active directory user accounts to the azure active directory thus the answer for this one is yes Now pay attention, sometimes the Microsoft questions will be a little trickier or they will change the options. So sometimes they will give you an option of MFA or multi-factor authentication. In that case, do mindful and choose a no in that case, right? So do not use, so do not choose a yes when multi-factor or MFA is given. 
be considerate to check that always Azure Active Directory is given and then only you choose a yes. Now we have question number 14, which says that your company subscription includes a basic support plan. They would like to request an assessment of an Azure environment design from Microsoft. This is however not supported by the existing plan. You want to make sure that the company subscribes to a support plan that allows this functionality while keeping the expenses to the minimum. Important points are you need to keep the expense to the minimum and the requirement is that you need an assessment of an Azure environment design from Microsoft. Moving on to the solution, you recommend that the company subscribes to a premier support plan. Does this meet the goal? Before answering the question, let me take you to the Microsoft site. Now here we are on the Microsoft site. On this page, you can read about all about the support plan and compare them as well. Now you can see that we have basic plan, developer plan, standard plan and professional direct plan. However, in the question it asked about or it mentioned about a premier plan. This is very interesting because Microsoft will test your knowledge to the full. So you need to be very firm with the plans. What are the different kind of plans and what does each of them consist? Now, first of all, we have already seen that there is no premier plan. Of course, then the answer is no. However, interesting is to understand that which plan actually offers the Microsoft assessment of your Azure design. If you will scroll to this page and come a little down. Now here you can see a link which says architecture support. You can already see that it is supported by developer, standard and professional direct. However, the level is a little different in developer and in standard. It says that it only supports general guidance. However, in the professional direct, it says that it supports guidance from a pool of pro direct delivery managers. Now, if you read about more on this architecture support, so here it says tackle your development milestones with the help of a Microsoft Azure engineer. Meet via interactive Microsoft team sessions and leave a detailed plan to architect, design, implement, migrate or grow your application on Azure. So you can see that this page talks about how you can design and get assessment from Microsoft on various aspects of your Azure design. Coming back on this page, now you know that developer, standard and professional direct, they do support assessment from Microsoft. However, the first one, the first two support the general guidance and the last one supports a guidance from pool of pro direct delivery managers. Thus, taking into consideration where the question asks that you need to keep the cost in minimum, I would have gone with the developer option. Coming back to our question, we don't have premier support plan as we saw on the Microsoft page. Thus, the answer for this one is a no. Now let's move on to our question number 15, which says that you are tasked with deploying Azure Virtual Machines for your company. You need to make use of appropriate cloud deployment solution. The solution given is that you should make use of software as a service, SaaS. Does this solution meet the goal? Now, before I answer this question, I want you to see all the variations of this question that can be asked in the examination. So for example, let's move to question number 16 and question number 17. Now you can see that the question is exactly the same. We are talking about virtual machines and you need to tell about an appropriate cloud deployment solution. Same here. However, the solution given is little different. In this one, question number 15, we are talking about SaaS. 
Question number 16, we are talking about IAS, which is infrastructure as a service. And then question number 17 talks about PaaS, which is platform as a service. So which one is a correct option? Here on this Microsoft page, it's a very interesting page where you can read about IAS, PaaS and SaaS offerings and learn more about their scope and what are they suitable for, advantages, disadvantages of each one of them. I will provide this useful link in the description box below as well. Coming back, here we see that this is IAS and IAS talks about virtual machines. So whenever the question asks you about virtual machine, you can be sure that it is always referring to IAS or infrastructure as a service. Now that you know that Azure Virtual Machine comes under IAS or Infrastructure as a Service, now it's pretty simple to answer all these three questions. So the answer to the question number 15 is a no. Then the answer to question number 16 is definitely a yes because we learned that virtual machines come under IAS. Then of course, the answer to question number 17 is also a no. Moving on with the question number 18. Question says that you are required to deploy an artificial intelligence AI solution in Azure. You want to make sure that you are able to build, test and deploy predictive analytics for the solution. The solution that is recommended is that you should make use of Azure Machine Learning Studio. So does this solution meet the goal? Now to tell you more about Azure Machine Learning Studio, it is actually a solution or an interface given to you by Microsoft that helps you create and deploy AI solution in Azure. The, the answer for this one is yes. So Azure Machine Learning Studio is the correct option. You can read more about Azure Machine Learning Studio on this page. So on this page, you will get entire details of Azure Machine Learning and a sample how you can start designing already your uh, applications or AI solution in Azure Machine Learning Studio. So it's a good page to come on before you start uh, jumping to the machine learning or AI solution in uh, Azure. Uh, key point to keep in mind is that uh, there has been a, or in fact there is there is a a classic version of machine learning studio as well and if you are more interested to know the differences between uh, the existing or the current azure machine learning studio and the classic one come ahead and go ahead and click here and here you can find all the differences between a feature by feature comparison between both of them so good page to learn Now quickly jumping to question number 19. In this question, it says your company's infrastructure includes a number of business units that each need a large number of various Azure resources for everyday operations. The resources required by each business unit are identical. You are required to sanction a strategy to create Azure resources automatically. The solution is you recommend that the Azure API management service to be included in the strategy. Do you think that this solution meet the goal? It's very important that you spot some of the keywords in the question. For example, it says that there are large number of resources uh, that are needed for everyday operation. So when it comes to large number of resources, then one thing will always click your mind is that this should not be a manual activity because manually deploying large number of resources can be very tricky and error prone. Secondly, it says that all the resources of by each business unit are identical. Now, if you're doing things manually, you're ought to do mistakes and you will forget something here and there and then the resources will never be identical. And this will create a mess because the requirement itself is the resources should be identical. 
So of course, first thing you already know, or you should keep in mind, or you should click your mind that this is definitely something not manual. Now, as I always do, I want to show you all the variations that you may expect in the AZ900 exam from Microsoft. There can be similar, there is similar question. However, solution for the question are different. So let's move on and check out the other variation. This is question number 20 and this is question number 22. Now if you will see and pay attention, you can see the question is exactly the same. Right? And if you remember correctly, then the question number 12 in this video was also the same. Why I'm repeating the question is to reinforce the concept in your mind and to show you the variations that that can come in the exam. So just a reinforcement to help you for the exam. So now you see we have same question but different solution. The first one says that you recommend Azure API management service. The second one says that you recommend management group to be included in the strategy. The third one says that you recommend Azure Resource Manager template to be included in the strategy. So which one will you pick as the correct answer? Okay, so Azure API Manager, as the name suggests that it is a API manager that helps you create and deal with the APIs. So it has nothing to do with deployment of resources, identical resources or large number of resources. So it's not even remotely connected to that. Talking about management group, management groups allow you to organize subscriptions and apply governance controls such as Azure policy and role-based access controls or RBAC. So management group is also not related to deploying of Azure resources automatically. Now coming to the last option, which says that you should use Azure resource manager template. So Azure resource manager or popularly also known as ARM templates is a way to deploy resources by using JSON files. And then this ARM template is a very powerful tool because it enables you to create large number of resources and the results you can always be sure that they are identical. So let me take you to the Microsoft site which will tell you more about ARM templates. So now here we are on the Microsoft site, which gives you details about ARM templates. So as I say that ARM templates helps you deploy a large number of resources automatically. You can read these things here. I will just very briefly uh, highlight them and you can read them uh, when you have time. So this section tells you that the infrastructure as a code for Azure solution use ARM resource template or ARM templates. So the template is JavaScript object notation or the JSON file that defines infrastructure and configuration for your project. So it said the templates are very declarative. So you can do a lot of things very quick uh, and with precise uh, accuracy. Uh, then there is a very nice video uh, which you can go ahead and see about uh, ARM templates and then it gives you some of the key factors that you can consider while choosing ARM templates. So declarative syntax, repetitable results and this is one of the, uh, one of the requirements of the question that the results should be repetitable or the results are identical. So uh, it can be said in uh, many ways, but this is what the question asks. So a lot of information about ARM template. So go ahead and check out this page from Microsoft site. Coming back to our slide, now that I have given you a brief about all the solutions, Azure API management group and Azure resources, uh, Azure resource manager, uh, now I think you can already answer the all the three questions. So let's check out the correct answers. So for the 19th one, the answer is no. For 20th, the answer is again a no. And now we know that the correct answer is ARM template. 
So whenever you are seeing a question is about lot of resources getting deployed, the results, the results should be identical or repeatable or these kind of stuff, then you always think of ARM templates as an answer. So now let's quickly jump to our question number 22. The question says that you are tasked with deploying a critical LOB which will be installed on a virtual machine to Azure. You are informed that the application deployment strategy should allow for guaranteed availability of 99.99%. You need to make sure that the strategy requires as little virtual machines and availability zones as possible. The solution is you include two virtual machines and one availability zone in your strategy. Does that meet the goal? Now, as I always do, I will give you all the variations of this question that can come in Microsoft Easy 900 exam. So let's first uh, check out the variations of this question and then we will jump on to understand the answer. So this is the another variation. So this is another variation, question number 23. And then I have question number 24 with one more variation. So the other solution in question number 23 says, the question being the same, the solution says that you include one virtual machine and two availability zone in your strategy. Whereas in question number 24, it says you include two virtual machines and two availability zones in your strategy. Now the key points or keywords that you need to pick in this question is the solution should allow for a guaranteed availability of 99.99%. So this is a key factor of deciding for the solution. So it could have been 99.99 and it could also be 99.95. So depending upon the question, we would need to select the answer. Now let me take you to the Microsoft page so that you can better understand the answer, the answer that I will pick and why I have picked that answer, the reason behind that. So let's go to the Microsoft page. So here I am on the Microsoft page which gives clear details about SLA for virtual machines. Here you can see they have given some of the combinations and what is the least expected uh, uptime or availability time that you can expect with the solution or with the arrangement of virtual machine and availability zone. So let's check out the first one. It says that for all virtual machine that have two or more instances deployed across two or more availability zone in the same Azure region, we guarantee that, that you will have virtual machine connectivity to at least one instance at at least 99.99 of the time. This is very important for us as this is the expectation from our solution as well. Now you can see there is 99.99, sorry, 99.95% as well. So whenever the question asks for 99.95, then you have to choose from this option. However, for now that we should have at least two or more instances of virtual machines and availability zones. So keyword is two or more. Coming back to our question, our question also demanded the same that we should have 99.99 and we should also take care that we should possibly deploy the solution which requires as little virtual machines and availability zones as possible. Now from the Microsoft page, we learned that at least we should have two availability zones and two virtual machines to give a 99.99% of availability. With that understanding, now let's answer question number 22, 23 and 24. So the answer for Question number 22 is a no. Why? Because it, though it takes two virtual machines, it just takes only one availability zone. 
So if your availability zone fails, then your solution is gone. And then you won't get a 99.99. Similarly, for question number two as well, it says one virtual machine and two availability zone. So even though you have two availability zone, you still have one virtual machine that actually defeats the purpose. The correct answer for 23 is also a no. Moving on with question number 22, we have two virtual machines and two availability zone. And that's exactly what we saw on the Microsoft page. Thus, the correct answer for question number 24 is a yes. So guys, why I'm presenting these variations of all these questions is to help you out understand not only from the perspective of exam, but also overall concept of Azure and how things or virtual machines or availability zones or the other things that we saw in the previous questions, how the concept actually works. I hope you're liking the way of presentation for our AZ900 exam question series. Now let's jump to our question number 25, which will be the last question for this part two. The question says that your company's developer intend to deploy a large number of custom virtual machines on a weekly basis. They will be also removing these virtual machines during the same week it was deployed. 60% of the virtual machines have Windows Server 2016 installed, while the other 40% has Ubuntu Linux installed. You are required to make sure that the administrative effort needed for this process is reduced by employing a suitable Azure service. The solution given here is, you recommend the use of Microsoft Manage Desktop. Does the solution meet the goal? Now, if you have watched the part one, in part one, we had question number one and question number two, in which we discuss two more variations of the same question. However, in question number one, the solution given was Azure Reserve Virtual Machine. And, and in question number two, the solution was given Azure Dev Test Lab. If you have not watched the part one of this series, I would encourage you to watch that video as well because that will give you insights of why I chose Azure Dev Test Lab as a solution for this kind of business scenario. For now, as for question number 25, the answer to this one is a no because Microsoft Managed Desktop is a device as a service or you can also call it a DAS offering in which Microsoft manages your desktop for a monthly fee. So there can be a lot of uses for these kind of Microsoft managed desktop. For example, these days when you are working from home and let's say you uh, need a desktop or a machine to work on, then you can go ahead and spin a Microsoft managed desktop. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Black Hole. This is our part 3 of our AZ900 real exam questions and answer series. In this part, we will be covering question number 26 to question number 40. I hope you have already watched part one, which covered question number one to question number 10, and then part two, which covered question number 11 to question number 25. So let's begin part three. Our question number 26 says, your company intends to subscribe an Azure support plan. The support plan must allow for new support requests to be opened. Which of the following support plans that will allow this? So in these kind of questions, what you need to do is you are given some of the options here. And as the question says that you need to drag and drop these options, whatever options are correct to this answer area. So I will quickly jump to the Microsoft side and let's see what are the valid support plans that allow you to open support request. So here we are. On the Microsoft site, 
that talks about support plans. We have four different support plans, basic, developer, standard, and professional direct. Just scroll down a little and here you see a section that says ability to submit as many support tickets as you need. This one is supported by all types of support plans. Thus, our correct answers are <clears throat> basic. So let's drag it to the answer area. Then the second one is developer, dragging it. The third correct answer is standard. The fourth answer is professional direct. And as you saw, we don't have any plan which is named as premier. So that's a wrong option here. Now let's move on to our question number 27. Our question number 27 says, your company has data centers in Los Angeles and New York. The company has a Microsoft Azure subscription. You are configuring the two data centers as geocluster sites for site resiliency. You need to recommend an Azure storage data redundancy option. You have the following data storage requirement. Data must be stored on multiple nodes. Data must be stored on nodes in separate geographic locations. Data can be read from secondary location as well as from the primary location. Which of the following Azure store redundancy option should you recommend? The options are geo redundant storage, read only geo redundant storage, zone redundant storage, and locally redundant storage. In this question, it's important to note the requirement. The first requirement is multiple nodes. Then you should be deploying a strategy which, in which data is stored in a separate geographic location. So this is very important that we have to keep in mind separate geographic location. Then we have the data can be read from the secondary location. Now, as you can see, it's separate geographic location. Thus, the option D is already ruled out because it's locally redundant storage. Option C is also ruled out because it's zone redundant storage. And this does not allow any geographic location storage separation. We are only left with geo redundant storage and read only geo redundant storage. Now, the important clue for choosing between these two is the option C. That says that you're gonna read from secondary location. So the difference between geo redundant and read only geo redundant is that, that in case of geo redundant, the other secondary location from there, you can only read the data. And that's exactly what we want from this question. We want to read the data from the secondary location. So the correct answer is option B, read only geo redundant storage. If you want to have a look or read more about this redundancies, then I will give you a link. Let me show you the link. You can read it more and understand them better. Now here I am on the Microsoft page, which talks about Azure storage redundancy. You can see a uh, lot of details are given. We have here local redundant storage, then we have zone redundant storage. Uh, detailing out is also given and it helps you explain how it works. Then you can see the diagrammatical uh, explanation of each of them. Uh, and then you have this geo redundant here. So uh, you can understand this better uh, and if you scroll down now here in this table they have compared all the different types of data redundancy so come on to this page have a look and understand them better so let's talk about our question number 28 question number 28 says an azure administrator plans to run a powershell script that creates Azure resources. You need to recommend which compute configuration to use to run the script. The solution given is run the script from a computer that runs Linux and has Azure CLI tools installed. Does this meet the goal? Now, as you can see, this question talks about PowerShell. So there are multiple variations that can come in exam. So let's see all the variation that you can expect 
from these kind of questions in Microsoft exam AZ900. We have question number 29. Same question, however, the solution is different. Now it says that run the script from a computer that runs Chrome operating system and uses Azure Cloud Shell. The third variation that I have is question number 30. In this question, it says run the script from a computer that runs on Mac OS and has a PowerShell Core 6.0 installed. So you can see there are multiple flavors. First, they talked about Linux, then they talked about Chrome OS and it uses Azure Cloud Shell. Then it is coming to Mac OS that uses PowerShell Core 6.0. It's very important to first understand what is PowerShell. So let's talk about a brief about PowerShell. So here I am on the Microsoft site and you can see I have opened a page that talks about PowerShell. What is PowerShell? So PowerShell is designed for managing and administrating Azure resources from the command line. Use PowerShell when you want to build automated tools that uses Azure resource manager model. So here I am on my Azure portal. Check out this button here, which shows or denotes a sort of prompt. So if you click it, then it says that, okay. So first of all, it asks you or tells you that, that for now, there is no storage mounted. So as you can see, it says that Azure Cloud Shell requires Azure File Share to persist file. So whenever you're running this PowerShell or Bash, you also need a small storage account. And that's exactly what it says, that this will create a new storage account for you and this will incur a small monthly cost. So whenever you are done with your work, do not forget to remove this storage account. So let's create this storage account and then I will show you one simple command of PowerShell. So let's create the storage account. This will take a little while. So let me just fast forward the video and then I will come back. Now you can see it has started to create the storage account. It's done. So this is normally also called as terminal window. So you can see there are actually two options. You can choose from PowerShell and you can also choose from Bash. Bash is most likely to be used by people who are coming from the Linux or Unix background. So, but for now we are talking about PowerShell. So we will select PowerShell. So it says that now you are switching to PowerShell. You just confirm. And here you go. Now you have a PowerShell prompt. So in order to get started, let me do a very simple command. Let me just tell you how you can list all your resources um, in your Azure subscription. So as you can see that I run a command, which is get az resource. This command is nothing. It just lists down all the resources that I have in my Azure subscription. Now you can see I have, it shows that I have a storage account. Similarly, if you have more resources created in your subscription, it will list them all. Okay, so now that we understand what is a PowerShell, why it is used and how you can get started with it, one important thing that you would already note that I have not installed anything to run this PowerShell. I'm just using it on my browser. So keep that in mind because that will come handy whenever you are answering the questions. Okay, so now coming back to the page. Now let me take you to the page. I have opened this page. So now here I am on the page which talks about uh, install the AZ uh, PowerShell module. So here, let's read out the first line, which is very interesting. So uh, it says that this article explain how to install Azure AZ PowerShell using the PowerShell get. These instructions work on Windows, Mac OS and Linux platform. So keep this in mind. So you can you have already seen that I was able to run PowerShell just with a browser. Then it also says that you can run PowerShell 
from a Windows, Mac OS and Linux platform. It can run on all major operating system. One requirement that you have to keep in mind is PowerShell 7.0.6 LTS and PowerShell 7.1.3 or higher is recommended version of PowerShell. So these are the nitty gritties that you can learn here on this page. Now let's move back to our PPT and answer the questions. So coming back to the question number 28, this one says that we need to run the script from a computer that run Linux and has Azure CLI tools installed. Does this meet the goal? So the answer for this question is a no. Why? Because of course PowerShell can run from a Linux computer. However, it needs PowerShell to be installed. But here the question only tells about that it's only Azure CLI tools installed. It actually needs PowerShell core to be installed. Thus, it's a no here. Moving on with question number 29, uh, a computer that runs Chrome OS and uses Azure Cloud Shell. You just saw when I logged in to my account in Azure, I was just using a Chrome browser and I opened the Azure Cloud Shell from the same browser. So, and I was, and I was able to run the PowerShell. So the answer for this one is a yes. Yes, you can run. Moving on with question number 30. In this one, it says that you need to run, you would run PowerShell from a Mac OS that has PowerShell code installed. So we saw that we can run PowerShell from Mac OS and it has also got the prerequisite, which is PowerShell Core 6.0 installed. Thus, the answer for this one is also a yes. You see the difference between question number 28 and 30th. Here we had Linux, we have Mac OS here. Here we just have Azure CLI tools installed. Had there been PowerShell Core 6.0 installed here also, the answer would have been a yes here also. But for now, it just talks about Azure CLI. Now let's move to question number 31. It's a similar kind of question. So let's read it out. You have an Azure environment. You need to create a new Azure virtual machine from a tablet that runs Android operating system. Solution is that you use Bash in Cloud Shell. From the demonstration that I gave you just a while back, I was running my Azure account from a Chrome browser, okay? And then I was able to run PowerShell, but I also showed you that by default, it opened Bash. So Bash is more for the Linux user. And uh, I mean, no, it's not that the other users cannot use it. It's actually preferred because it has very close syntax related to the uh, Unix or Linux. So you can run Bash or PowerShell Thus, I think you already got a fair idea that you can answer this question very easily. So the answer for this question is a yes. Of course, we can run the PowerShell or Bash from a computer that has uh, Android operating system and has an Azure Cloud Shell. Azure Cloud Shell is nothing but the prompt that we get in the Azure portal. So that's Azure Cloud Shell. Now let's start with question number 32. It says a Microsoft SQL database that is hosted in cloud and has a software updates managed by Azure is an example of what? Is it a disaster recovery as a service or DREAS or infrastructure as a service IAS, platform as a service PaaS or software as a service SaaS? Out of these four options, you have to choose the correct one which represents this situation. So what do we got? We have Microsoft SQL database. I have brought you to the Microsoft page, which talks about Microsoft SQL database. So you can read a lot about Microsoft database here. What is it? How does it help? And where does it fit? A great video about that. Read it out uh, about Microsoft SQL database. However, if you scroll down a little, then you can see this section here, which 
gives you more detail about the SQL database. And what it says is that Azure SQL database is a relational database as a service hosted in Azure that falls into industry category of platform as a service. And here is our answer. So let's answer this question in our slide as well. So now it's easy to answer that Microsoft SQL database is a pass offering. Now let's move on to question number 33, which says that your company plans to migrate all its data and resources to Azure. The company's migration plan states the only platform service solution to be used. You need to deploy an Azure environment that meets company's migration plan. What should you create? Important here that you note that the question is saying that only platform as a service or pass services must be used in the solution. You cannot use infrastructure as a service and you cannot use software as a service or any other kind of service, only pass offering. Now let's read the options. The option one is Azure Virtual Machine, Azure SQL Database and Azure Storage Account. Then option B is an Azure App Service and an Azure Virtual Machine that have Microsoft SQL Server installed. Then the option C is an Azure App Service and Azure SQL Database. Then the fourth option is Azure Storage Accounts and Web Server in Azure Virtual Machine. Now how to pick the right answer? Try to pick some of the key uh, words in the option. If you will see it closely, we have virtual machines in this option, the option A. Then we have virtual machine in option B as well. We don't have virtual machine here, but we do have virtual machines here. So it's important to understand in which category virtual machine comes in. Now here I am on a Microsoft page. Let's read the title of the page. It says infrastructure as a service, virtual machines and windows. I don't think I need to even read further. You already got an idea that virtual machines fall into the category of infrastructure as a service. Coming back to our slide, the correct answer for this question is option C. So kindly note here that Azure App Service, it's already a platform as a service and Azure Database, SQL Database, we already talked about in question number 32 that Azure SQL Database is a pass offering. So the combination of Azure App Service and Azure SQL Database is altogether a pass offering. And that's what the question asks that you only need to use pass offering. In the other option, Though we have SQL database and it's a pass offering, however, we have virtual machine as well. So the combination of all does not make it an overall pass service. That's why it is rejected. In the option B as well, we have Azure virtual machine. That's why the overall option is not a pass offering. Similar for option D, we have our Azure virtual machines, thus not making it a pass offering. So this way you can use the power of elimination to get to a right option, right? Look for the keywords that will help you to spot the right answer. Okay, with that, let's move on to our question number 34. Question number 34 says, what does a customer provide in software as a service or SaaS model? Do you provide application data or do you provide data storage or compute resources or application software? So let's just quickly understand what is a SaaS service. Software as a service allow users to create, sorry, to connect to and use cloud-based apps over the internet. Common examples are email, calendaring, office tools such as Microsoft Office 365. So you can see here, uh, this is software as a service. Let me give you a very easy example. Normally, whenever you are using your mail, so for example, you are using Outlook, Hotmail or Gmail or whatever, all these comes under SaaS category. What do you actually do? Do you 
Do you actually manage Gmail or Outlook? Do you know how it is made? No, we don't know. Where is it hosted? Which storage? Which server? Do we know that? No, we don't. And we don't even care about it. We just want to use the service. We just want to use the mail. And what do we provide? What do we generate using that service? We generate our data. That's it. We are not bothered about the operating systems, storage, how the networking is done, how the security is managed. We are not concerned about anything. We just know that we have a service and we want to use it. In software as a service, we only provide application data. So guys, all the links that I'm using or referring to in this video, as always, you will be finding all those links in the description box below. And I will also make sure to put them in the pinned comment. So you get your ready Reknar. Now let's move on to question number 35. It says, when you need to delegate permissions to several Azure machines simultaneously, you must deploy the Azure virtual machines to the same Azure region or by using same Azure resource manager template or to same resource group or to the same availability zone. You need to understand that what you are essentially doing is, is to delegate permissions to several Azure machines simultaneously. So this is the key catch here. The correct answer for this question is to the same resource group. Why? Because a resource group is actually a logical container for your Azure resources. It actually makes uh, management for the resources easier. So uh, within the resource group, you can manage all the resource in that group, such as virtual machine, website, or subnets. And the permissions that you apply to a resource group they kind of descend to all the resources under that uh, resource group. So that's the reason why I have chosen the correct answer as resource group. Coming to the other options that are given, Azure region. So Azure region is more related to building resiliency and reliability for your application. While on the other hand, Azure resource manager or ARM template is primarily linked for deployment of resources. Okay, uh, we have talked about ARM in our previous questions as well. So do check out the previous questions as well. Then coming to the availability zone, availability zone is again connected to building resiliency and reliability in your uh, applications. So the only correct answer here is the same resource group. Now let's move on to question number 36. It says that you plan to deploy several Azure virtual machines. You need to ensure that the service running on the Azure virtual machines are available if a single data center fails. The solution is you deploy virtual machines to more than two availability zone. Does this meet the goal? Keywords that you are deploying several Azure machines and the expectation is that you need to ensure that the service is running even if one data center fails and you are deploying the solution on two or more availability zone. So let's talk about a little more about availability zones. So here I am on the Microsoft site and this page talks about regions and availability zones. A brief description about region is given and in the availability zone section, you can read that availability zones are physically separate location within each Azure region that are tolerant to local failures. So um, if you look at this picture here, you can see this is one Azure region. And within this region, you have three availability zones. And each availability zone is composed of one or more data centers equipped with independent power, cooling, networking infrastructure. Further, it says that availability zones are designed so that if one zone is affected, regional services capacity and high availability are supported by the remaining two zones. Thus, as we saw on the Microsoft page, availability zone ensure that the services are running on virtual machines even if single data center fails. Thus, the answer for this question is a yes. Moving on with the question number 37. Now here we have 
what is the first stage in Microsoft Cloud Adaption Framework for Azure? The options given are adopt the cloud, make a plan, ready your organization and define your strategy. Coming to the Microsoft page, which talks about the cloud adoption framework for Azure, uh, you can read this page more. However, if you just scroll down a little, here you can understand the entire life cycle. And now if you see the diagram here, you can see that the first step that we are starting with is defining your strategy. So under this, you have understand motivation, business outcomes, business justification, or prioritize the project. So define strategy is the first step. Thus, the correct answer for question number 37 is option D, define your strategy. Moving on with the question number 38. It's a yes and no sort of question. So let's read out the first one. This one says, that Microsoft SQL 2019 installed on a virtual machine is an example of a PaaS service. Now, if you remember in question number 33, we talked about Azure Virtual Machine and how Azure Virtual Machine are a part of IAS, Infrastructure as a Service. When we are talking about virtual machine, always keep in mind it is always Infrastructure as a Service and then it's very easy to answer these kind of questions. So, of course, the definite answer for this one is a no. Then moving on with the second one, we have Azure SQL database is an example of platform as a service. In question number 32, I explained it in detail that SQL database is definitely an example of PaaS service. So the answer is, Yes, you can check out the question number 32 for more details. Now coming to the third question. The third question says Azure Cosmos DB is an example of software as a service. The right answer for this one is a no. Why? Let me show you. Reading on to this page, if you can see it talks about Azure Cosmos DB resource model and the very first line says Azure Cosmos DB is a fully managed platform as a service. Thus, we have rightfully answered it as a no. Moving on with our question number 39. This is also a yes no kind of question. So let's read the first one. This one says that each Azure subscription can contain multiple account administrator. It's very confusing question because there are a lot of views on various sites which uh, kind of uh, mixes up a lot of things. But I will take you to the Microsoft side that will clear out a lot of confusion. So here on this side, which talks about classic subscription administrator roles, Azure roles and Azure AD roles. Now, if you will scroll down a little more here, you find this, this section here, which says classic subscription administrator roles. And this one says that account administrator, service administrator, co-administrator, are three classic subscription administrator role in Azure. So it's important to know that when we are talking about account administrator, we are essentially also talking about the classic subscription administrator role. Okay. And now on this table, the first row itself says the account administrator, and you can see this limit section here. So what it says is that you can only have one account administrator per Azure account. Similarly, you can read about more roles which are related to the classic subscription. However, when it comes to the newer roles, then we normally talk about the roles like owner, contributor, reader and user access administrator. And of course, not to forget Azure AD roles for example, global administrator, user administrator, and billing administrator. And then we have uh, a difference between Azure roles and Azure AD roles. So come on to this page and understand various roles which are connected with uh, Azure accounts. So coming back to our question, we now know that we cannot have multiple account administrator. Thus, the answer for this one is a no. 
The second question says, each Azure subscription can be managed by using Microsoft account only. The answer for this one is also a no. Why? Let me take you to my Microsoft Azure account. So here you can see that I am logged in to my Azure portal and here you can very well note that this is not a Microsoft account. This is a non Microsoft uh, account or email that I have used to create my Microsoft Azure account. Also, one important thing is that when it comes to subscription, I link subscription or as I understand subscription is uh, something which is also related to the billing part. So whenever you get a bill for using Microsoft Azure, it is always coming to this uh, email uh, which you have used to create your account or subscription. So that's why uh, to me uh, saying that you can only have Microsoft uh, account to create the subscription is a wrong statement. Thus, I will choose a no here for this question. Moving on, we have an Azure resource group can contain multiple Azure subscription. This is also a wrong statement. Why? This statement is wrong. The vice versa is true. A single Azure subscription can contain multiple Azure resource group. Thus, the answer is a no. Now, let's move on to our question number 40, which will be the last question for part three. Again, a yes, no type of question. The first one says availability zones can be implemented in all Azure regions. So the answer for this one is again a no. Why? Because though availability zones are available in almost all Azure regions, but not all. You can read more about this uh, on the same link that I used or showed you in the question number 36 that will give you more insights um, and tell you that uh, not all Azure regions support availability zones. Now coming to the question number two, it says that only virtual machines that run on Windows Server can be created in an availability zone. The answer for this one is also a no because of course you can use other flavors like Linux also to create uh, servers on availability zone. So definitely a no. Then moving on to the last one. This one says that availability zones are used to replicate data and application to multiple regions. Now, as we talked about in our previous questions as well, availability zones are actually used to build reliability and resiliency in your uh, application or services. It is not used to replicate data. Thus, the answer for this question is also a no. Coincidentally, on this slide, I just noticed that all the answers are no. But, but yeah, it happens. I hope you liked part three of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Black Hole. This is our part 4 of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. Today we are going to cover from question 41 to 55. In the earlier series, part 1, 2 and 3, we have already covered from question number 1 to question number 40. So 40 questions already covered and today we are going to cover another 15 questions. So let's get started. So let's begin with our question number 41. The question says that you have been informed by your superiors of the company's intention to automate the server deployment to Azure. There is, however, some concern 
that administrative credentials could be uncovered during this process. You are required to make sure that during the deployment, the administrative credentials are encrypted using a suitable Azure solution. The solution given here is that you recommended the use of Azure Multi-Factor Authentication or MFA. Now we have to tell whether MFA or Azure Multi-Factor Authentication solve this business problem. Keywords in the questions are encryption of administrative credentials. The solution is multi-factor. To tell you more about Azure multi-factor authentication, that's actually a process in which users are kind of prompted during their sign-ins for additional form of identification. So for example, sometimes you may be asked that you are provided with an SMS on your phone or maybe some fingerprint scan. So it's an additional check whenever you are signing in to some of your application or some of your service that you use. So an additional form of uh, verification is done uh, and that's the use of multi-factor authentication. However, multi-factor authentication has nothing to do with encryption. Thus, the correct answer for this one is a no. Coming to question number 42. Your company has an Azure Active Directory Azure AD environment. Users occasionally connect to Azure AD via the internet. You have been tasked with making sure that users who connect to Azure AD via internet from an unidentified address are automatically encouraged to change the password. The solution that given is you configure the use of Azure AD identity protection. One more exactly same question with a different solution is question number 43. Question exactly same. However, the solution says that you configure the use of Azure AD privileged identity management. So let me first come to the question number 42 and answer this question first. So the correct answer for question number 42 is yes. Yes, Azure AD identity protection is the perfect solution where you want to prompt user to change their password whenever they are logging in from an unidentified uh, address, IP address. So that's the exact solution that you want to implement. Uh, to give you more insights on Azure AD identity protection, I will take you to the Microsoft site and let's see uh, what it says. So on this page from Microsoft, uh, the title is what is identity protection? You can read it more, but I will take you to this section, which is the most relevant uh, to answer this question. And that section is actually uh, this one, uh, which says risk detection and remediation. So in this one, you can see that identity protection identifies the risk of many types, including anonymous IP address use, atypical travel, malware linked, IP address, unfamiliar sign-in properties, leaked credentials, password spray, and many more. Pay your attention to this one. This is anonymous IP address use. So now you can see um, the question was also asking you uh, that you should uh, put a solution that prompts the user to change the password whenever he or she are logging from an unidentified IP address and this is uh, the proof of our answer. Additionally, Microsoft can also ask for different types or change the language or change the option. So keep in mind that what all uh, is provided by identity protection. So you can see that uh, if the question takes a twist and it asks you instead of anonymous IP address, it may ask you malware linked IP address, okay, or maybe leaked credentials, right, or maybe unfamiliar sign-in properties. Then you know that in all those cases, you have to go for Microsoft Identity Protection. Thus, the correct answer is a yes. Now that we have already answered question number 42, it's already clear that the answer for this one, question number 43, is a 
No. So Azure AD Privileged Identity Management or PIM is a service in Azure Active Directory or Azure AD uh, that actually enables you to manage, uh, control, uh, and sometimes even monitor the access to the important resources in your organization. But in this case, our requirements are different and Azure Privileged Identity Management does not fit. Moving on to the next question. The next question says that your company's Active Directory Forest includes thousands of user account. You have been informed that all network resources will be migrated to Azure. Thereafter, the on-premises data center will be retired. You are required to employ a strategy that reduces the effect on users once the planned migration has been completed. Important that you note that what we are essentially doing is that we are migrating all the user account from an on-premise. Pay attention from an on-premise uh, Active Directory to the Azure Active Directory. So that's what the requirement is. And the second important thing that the question says that you need to make sure that it reduces the effect on the users. So the users, the let's say the employee of your company, they should not be impacted by this migration. Now, if you remember, and if you have already seen the part two of our easy 900 real exam question and answer series, this is part four. Uh, in that, I in the question number 13, uh, that was the same question. In that question, the solution was to sync Active Directory user accounts to Azure Active Directory or Azure AD. And there I explained in quite a detail why that solution or why uh, syncing to Active Directory user account to Azure Active Directory was a correct option. In this case, however, it's mentioned or the solution is MFA. Now, MFA is actually a process in which users are prompted to sign in uh, with additional details, additional identification details, as we also saw in question number 41. So it is a extra security measure to strengthen your uh, sign in process. In this case, our requirement is something else in which MFA does not fit. Thus, the answer for this question is a no. Coming to question number 45. You are planning a strategy to deploy numerous web servers and database servers to Azure. This strategy should allow for connection types between web server and database servers to be controlled. The solution is that you include a local network gateway in your strategy. Does this solution meet the goal? Same question, one more with a slight variation in the solution is question number 46. And this time the solution is you include network security groups, NSG in your strategy. Does this meet the goal? So out of these two solution, one is local network gateway or the other one is network security group. Which one meets the goal to bring a strategy that allow for connection between the web server and the database server. So, uh, let me first make you understand what is uh, NSG. You already can relate what is the local network gateway. So local network gateway or local network is more related to your on-prem uh, networks. So here we are on network security group or NSG, the official documentation from Microsoft. So let's read this first para. So this says that you can use Azure Network Security Group to filter network traffic to and from Azure resources in an Azure virtual network. Pay attention. It has already mentioned that this is used uh, to filter network to and from Azure resources in Azure virtual network. Okay, moving on, it says that a network security group contains security rules that allow or deny inbound traffic to or outbound traffic from several type of Azure resources. 
for each rule you can specify source and destination port and protocol hope you remember the question the question was that we need to control or manage the connections between our web server and our database server so both are azure resources here in azure virtual network and we have to control the traffic between them and that's exactly what nsg provides you now that you have understood how nsg fits in this business case the answer to these question is pretty simple taking question number 45 first the answer is obviously no because it's just local network gateway it has nothing to do uh, with securing or you know managing the connections between uh, two azure resources and the answer to the question number 46 is a definite yes so friends uh, these kind of questions can be very tricky to understand sometimes you know uh, to understand the business case and scenarios and relate different azure resources uh, to the question so uh, what i did is uh, i picked up some of the keywords uh, that you can pick from the questions and then try to associate those keywords with the solution so uh, please uh, mind that this is not a sure shot uh, way of uh, giving the answers to the question however it might help you uh, a lot uh, when you're trying to you know think upon the answers when you're giving the exam so here it goes so whenever you are seeing the word uh, in questions like attack um, sorry for the bad handwriting um, then you have to associate this one attack with uh, ddos okay then you look for the ddos as a solution okay however if in the question it's talking more about uh, rules okay uh, then uh, in that case you have to uh, pick a solution which says firewall okay because firewall is a set of rules yes so then you have to uh, choose firewall as a as a solution uh, then in case you see uh, keywords which says uh, allow uh, or deny right in this case go for the solution uh, nsg or network security group as we just saw in this question so I hope this, this combination of keywords and solution will help you in the exam. Um, and once again, uh, sorry for the bad handwriting, uh, but hope uh, you got the drift. Okay, so let's move on. Our next question 47 is that you have an on-premises network that contains several servers. You plan to migrate all servers to Azure. You need to recommend a solution that ensures that some of the servers are available even if a single Azure data center goes offline for an extended period. What should you include in the recommendation? Should it be fault tolerance or elasticity or should it be scalability or low latency? Now first let's understand uh, one liner uh, definitions or understanding uh, of all these terms. And then we will come back to answer. Fault tolerance is actually an ability of a system to continue functioning uh, even in a case of a failure of some of its components. Okay, so you have a solution, you have an application uh, and each application is made up of uh, many components, uh, database and network, uh, web servers and a lot more. So Fault tolerance says that you build your application in such a way that uh, even if some of your component fails, so let's say you have a database server and that fails. So what, what now? Will your application crash? And that's a very bad design. So what you can essentially use that uh, you build a failover mechanisms, something like messaging queue, 
So even if your database fails, then even then the messages or interaction or transaction coming from your um, customers who are using that application is still getting saved in messaging queue. And whenever the database is online again, then you can uh, release those messages uh, to the database and let your uh, business logic run on them. In this way, you are building a sort of fault tolerance in your application. I hope you understand. Coming to elasticity. So elasticity is the ability of your hardware layer to actually increase or shrink uh, the amount of physical resources uh, offered by the hardware layer uh, to the software layer. So uh, the increase uh, and decrease is actually triggered by, uh, by the business rules uh, defined. Uh, I mean, of course, you define these kind of business rules in advance, uh, which uh, governs this uh, increase and decrease of uh, the of hardware. Uh, so this is elasticity. Coming to the scalability. So scalability is ability of your software system to process higher amount of workloads um, on its current hardware uh, resources. So it actually scales up and uh, process the increased workload uh, which may come in your application. So for example, you have a website, an e-commerce website, which is um, uh, handling the customer orders. And let's say is it's a festival time and you expect a lot more orders to come than usual. So your application should be scalable so that it's able to handle that increased workload. So that's, that's uh, scalability. There is actually a lot of confusion between elasticity and scalability. And so if you are looking for uh, a video, a dedicated video, uh, which describes the uh, differences between uh, elasticity and scalability do uh, mention that in the comment section below and I will make a dedicated video for that as well. Coming to the low latency so low latency is actually it, it actually describes a computer network that is optimized to process a very high volume of messages with a, uh, with a minimum delay so that's what low latency is. Does the correct answer for this question is for tolerance. Moving on with our question number 48. Uh, it's a kind of fill in the blanks question type. Uh, so let's read it out. It says an organization that hosts its infrastructure dash uh, no longer requires a data center. So you need to tell when uh, an organization if it moves to private cloud or hybrid or public or hyper V uh, then it's in a state where it does not need to use its on premises data center. So let's understand very briefly about private cloud is of course the on prem uh, and then of course you are using the data center. So you you are not going to get rid of it if you are moving to private cloud hybrid is a combination of private and public. In that case, you might get rid of some of the servers or data center, but not all because you are still hybrid and you are still keeping your private uh, cloud. Then we have public cloud. So public cloud is a cloud offering in which you move your infrastructure uh, entirely to the public cloud. And in this case, you won't require uh, a data center. Hyper-V is not uh, even remotely related to uh, what we are talking in the question. So ruling that out, we have the correct answer as public cloud. So when an organization moves to public cloud, it no longer requires data center. So you have to fill public cloud here. Now let's move to question number 49. The question says, what are the two characteristics of public cloud? Each correct answer represents a complete solution. The options are dedicated hardware, unsecured connection, limited storage, metered pricing or self-service management. So first coming to dedicated hardware. So in public cloud, 
you have to pay attention it's public cloud it's when we talk about public cloud the underlying hardware is actually shared so you could have multiple customers using the same cloud resources hosted in same physical hardware so dedicated hardware is not a correct option moving on with unsecured connection definitely not the connections over the public cloud are fully secure limited storage well no uh, the basic concept of public cloud uh, in one sense it says that you have virtually unlimited storage amount you can scale up your storage needs to the maximum to how how much you want so there is virtually no limit how much you can scale up so definitely limited storage is also not a correct option then we come to metered price whenever we are talking about uh, any cloud is not uh, related to only azure but also true to aws or google gcp so each each cloud provider in public cloud offers you metered pricing what what does that actually mean so metered pricing is a concept where you are charged or you are billed for the amount of resources that you use then self service management so self service management is a concept where uh, you go to the cloud portal or let's say uh, you go to the azure portal and then you want a virtual machine uh, you just uh, go to the portal there is a there is an interface go to the interface choose some of the options and then spin a virtual machine you don't have to raise a request or maybe a ticket to microsoft uh, agents um, to bring up a virtual machine for you so it's all happening self service thus the correct option for question number 49 are meter pricing and self service management moving on with our question number 50 the question number 50 says when planning to migrate a public website to azure you must deploy a vpn pay monthly usage cost need to transfer all the website data to azure or the fourth option is reduce the number of connection to the website so whenever you are trying to move to azure or any other cloud provider uh, what you are essentially doing is that you are migrating from capex uh, capital expenditure to opex which is operational expenditure so you will use or consume some resources and for that you will be billed on a monthly basis thus the correct option for question number 50 is option b pay monthly usage cost moving on with question number 51 which says on which layer is ddos protection applied is it on application layer is it on network layer or is it on perimeter layer so here i am on the microsoft page which is related to defense in depth and it gives you a lot of information how defense in depth is implemented uh, in microsoft azure or in uh, cloud in general so uh, zero trust model defense in depth what is the layered approach is very important because many questions come uh, from this area so you must understand defense in depth and also understand what are the physical layers for it now if you will scroll down a little on this page you can see the section called perimeter and when you reach here the first line says use distributed denial of service ddos protection to filter large scale attacks before they can cause denial of service for the user so now you can see that ddos or distributed denial of service is related to the perimeter layer so the answer for question number 51 is option c perimeter layer now let's move on to question number 52 it says when you are implementing software as a service saas solution you are responsible for what are you responsible for configuring high availability or are you responsible for defining scalability rules or are you responsible 
for installing SAS solution or configuring the SAS solution. Now, as we have discussed in many other question as well, that uh, whenever you are implementing software as a service, you are responsible for configuring the solution. Everything else is actually taken care by the cloud provider. Take an example of Gmail services or email services. Now, whenever you're using email services or services like Microsoft Office 365, what are you essentially doing? You are actually just consuming this service. You don't know how Gmail or any other email services build. You, you don't know how Microsoft 365 works or how it is deployed, what are its configuration, how it's installed and lot of other things. So you don't care about those uh, questions you need to use uh, the service. So that's uh, what uh, important is. So the correct answer for question number 52 is configuring the SaaS solution. Let's move on to our question number 53. It's a yes and no kind of question. So let's read the first statement. The first statement says that Azure provides flexibility between capital expenditure and operational expenditure. Now this kind of question can be really confusing. Normally, whenever we are talking about Azure or cloud services, they are more related to operational cost, uh, which is OPEX. However, there is one case where which I can think of uh, the Azure reserved virtual machines. So in reserved virtual machine, you actually book or reserve the virtual machine for a longer period of time, for example, one year, two or three years, uh, and then you get a huge discount from Microsoft. So that's one area where uh, capital expenditure can be associated. Thus, that's the reason I have chosen a yes for this statement. Moving on, we have second statement which says, if you create two Azure virtual machine that uses B2S size, each virtual machine will always generate same monthly cost. Now you need to understand that even if you are spinning same size of virtual machine, uh, B2S uh, size in this case, it is not uh, essential that they will always generate a same monthly cost because there are other factors. For example, there can be other uh, configuration settings with the virtual machines that can be different. Uh, more so, the location of virtual machine uh, itself has a big impact on cost. So uh, two locations, two different locations where you deploy a virtual machines can have different costs because some of the location in Azure Microsoft are costlier than the other locations. So even if the size of virtual machine or any other resource uh, deployed on different location are same, they can still have different costs. Thus, the answer for this question is a no. Moving on to the third statement we have, when an Azure virtual machine is stopped, you continue to pay storage costs associated to the virtual machine. Well, the answer for this one is a yes. Reason being that whenever you are using a virtual machine, even if it's uh, stopped, then you stop paying the cost which is associated with the virtual machine. However, each virtual machine has a associated storage as well. When you stop the virtual machine, of course, the virtual machine is stopped, but the storage continues. And that's the reason that you still continue to pay the cost of the storage. And that's the logic behind choosing a yes for this statement. Moving on to our question number 54. The first statement says a platform as a service or PaaS solution that hosts web apps in Azure provides full control of operation system that holds the application. Now, if you look upon the past services or past solutions, then uh, the web apps that are hosted uh, in past uh, solutions in those cases. So you just take your application and deploy it. Other than that, behind the scenes, you virtually don't have much control over the operating systems. Thus, the answer for this statement is a no. The second statement says that a platform as a service solution that hosts web apps in Azure provides the ability to scale the platform automatically. The correct answer for this one is a yes. Because 
The ability to scale platform automatically in past solution is called auto scaling. So the answer for this one is a yes. Moving on with the third statement, we have a past solution that hosts web apps in Azure provides professional development services to continuously add features to custom application. In order to answer this question, I will take you to the Microsoft site. So this is the Microsoft site and here you can read more about app service overview and why use app services. You can see there are a lot of benefits of it. Uh, for example, you have multiple languages and framework managed uh, production environment and lot of others. When you scroll down and come a little down and you come to this section, here you can read that besides app services, Azure offers other services that can be used for hosting websites and application. So from here, from this statement, I get an idea that yes, there is a possibility to add more services whenever using uh, app services in pass offering. And with that understanding, I have chosen the answer for this statement as a yes. Coming to question number 55, which is the last question for our part four. The question says that in Azure, pay as you go is, is it a capital expenditure or is it a operational expenditure? So guys, always remember whenever we are talking about pay as you go or Azure in general, it is always operational expenditure or OPEX. So the correct answer is B. I hope you liked the 15 questions that we have taken in this part four. If you think that there are some questions that are missed or you want to talk about or discuss about, then please go ahead and put your questions in the comment section below. I will make a point to answer all of your questions. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and I welcome you all to another exciting episode on the Tech Blackboard. This is our part 5 of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. In this part, we are going to cover question number 56 to question number 70, a total of 15 questions. In the earlier four parts, we have already covered from question number one to question number 55. If you have missed watching all these four parts, I strongly recommend that go ahead and watch these four parts as well. Because in these four parts, I have taken and explained many of the concepts that will give you a sound understanding and a solid base to clear AZ-900 exams with really good marks. For now, let's get started with our part five. So let's begin our part five with question number 56. The question says that you plan to provision infrastructure as a service resources in Azure. Which resource is an example of IAS? Is it an Azure web app or Azure virtual machine or Azure Logic App or Azure SQL Database. Now here on the Microsoft site, you can see the details about infrastructure as a service. As you scroll down, you will see the section which lists all the services and products which are counted as infrastructure as a service. You can see there is a compute, storage, networking, security and a lot more. If you click on compute, you will come to this page. And here you can find virtual machines. So this means that virtual machine are uh, infrastructure as a service. Thus, the correct answer for question number 56 is B, an Azure virtual machines. Friends, if you want the PPT that I am using in part 5, then you have to tell me the answer for question 58, 63 and 68 in the comment section below. And I will send you the PDF file of this part 5 PPT. You can use this PDF file to make your learning offline as well. Let's jump to our question number 57. The question says that you plan to migrate 
a web application to Azure. The web application is accessed by external users. You need to recommend a cloud deployment solution to minimize the amount of administrative effort used to manage web application. What should you include in the recommendation? Should it be software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, or database as a service? The correct answer for question number 57 is platform as a service because web applications in Azure are deployed in app services. Let me tell you more about app services. So Azure app services is a platform as a service offering that lets you create web and mobile apps from any platform or device and connect to data anywhere in cloud or on premise. App services include web and mobile capabilities that were previously delivered separately as Azure websites and Azure mobile. So you can see that web applications in Azure are deployed in Azure app services, which in turn are platform as a service. Thus, the correct answer is platform as a service. Now let's move on to our question number 58. Question number 58 says, in which type of cloud model are all the hardware resources owned by a third party and shared between multiple tenants? Is it private cloud, hybrid cloud, or is it public cloud? If you have watched my all parts, by now you would be easily able to answer this question. Whenever we are talking about private cloud, as the name suggests, it is private. It is our own. We are not sharing it with any other third party. Hybrid cloud is a combination of private and public where some of the resources are, are exclusive for us. That means they are private to us. However, some of the resources are on public cloud and shared with other tenants. Coming to the public cloud, in public cloud, we are sharing all the hardware resources with other multiple tenants as well. And all the hardware resources are actually owned by the third party or in other words, the cloud provider itself. Thus, the correct answer for this one is public cloud. Now let's check out question number 59. The question says, an Azure web app that queries an on-premise Microsoft SQL Server is an example of a cloud. So is it an example of private cloud, public cloud, hybrid cloud, or multi-vendor cloud? The answer for this question is, a hybrid cloud. The reason of choosing hybrid cloud over public or private cloud is hidden in the question itself. So if you take a closer look at the question, it says that an Azure web app that queries an on-premise Microsoft SQL Server. The first key word you need to pay attention is an on-premises Microsoft SQL Server. So one element that we have is an on-premise. Then we have an Azure web app. So now you can see there is one component web app which is deployed on Azure and the other component Microsoft SQL Server which is deployed on premise. Thus, it is a combination of both public and private components. That's why we have chosen a hybrid. I hope you understand the logic behind choosing hybrid cloud. Now let's move to question number 60. The question says that which cloud deployment solution is used for Azure Virtual Machines and Azure SQL Database. To answer the question, select appropriate options in the answer area. Now, as you can see, this question has two elements. The first one is Azure Virtual Machines and the second one is Azure SQL Database. So you have to tell whether Azure Virtual Machine is a software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, or database as a service. Similarly, for Azure SQL Database as well, you have to tell whether it's a software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, or database as a service. So let me give you the answer. So answer for Azure Virtual Machine is infrastructure as a service. In the very first question of this part 5, that was question number 56, I elaborated why Azure Virtual Machines are counted as infrastructure as a service. So go and check out that question once again if you have forgotten 
the logic. Coming to SQL database, if you have watched our part 3, in question number 32, I explained in a very detailed form that why Microsoft SQL database is taken as past service. Now let's move to question number 61. You plan to provision infrastructure as a service resources in Azure. Which resource is an example of IES? Is it Azure Web App, Azure Virtual Machine, Logic App or Azure SQL Database? The answer for this question is Azure Virtual Machine. Friends, sometimes I'm repeating the questions. This repetition is intentional. The reason being that repetition makes you understand the logic and it imprints the answer in your brain. So whenever you're going to attempt uh, the Microsoft AZ-900 examination, this repetition will help you recall the answers quickly. Coming to question number 62. The question says an Azure web app that queries an on-premise Microsoft SQL Server is an example of a cloud. Is it private, public, hybrid or multi-vendor? Again, a repeat question because of the fact that we want to repeat important questions so that it's easier for you to recall in the exam. Again, just to give you a hint, it's a combination of Azure resource, a web app and our own premise resource, which is Microsoft SQL Server, thus making it a hybrid. The correct answer is hybrid. Moving on with question number 63. You have 1000 virtual machine hosted on Hyper-V host in a data center. You plan to migrate all virtual machines to an Azure pay-as-you-go subscription. Which expenditure model should you identify? Now friends, I have told you many times, whenever you see pay as you go in the question, you can always relate that to operational expenditure. So the correct answer for question number 63 is operational. Moving on to question number 64. It's a yes and no question. The first statement says that Azure pay as you go pricing is an example of CAPEX. We just saw and I told you that pay as you go is always related to operational cost. Thus, the answer for this statement is no. Then paying electricity for your data center is an example of OPEX. The answer for this one is a yes. The reason being that whenever we are talking about recurring cost, for example, paying your electricity bill, paying your mobile bill, these kinds of costs are recurring cost and these costs are based on your consumption so this is also pay as you go thus it should be opax and that's the correct answer as well then the third statement says deploying your own data center is an example of capex of course the answer is correct or a yes the reason being that whenever you're deploying a data center it includes high upfront cost and upfront cost is nothing but capex thus the answer is a yes one pro tip to distinguish between opex and capex is always keep in mind that whenever you're talking about a cost which is recurring in nature that is always opex or operational cost however upfront costs are always categorized as capex or capital expenditure i hope this helps you answering the questions now let's quickly jump to question number 65. To which cloud models can you deploy physical servers? Can you deploy on public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud and public cloud? Or you can deploy only on hybrid cloud or is it public cloud and hybrid cloud? Now physical server are considered as on-premise as well. So in public cloud, you don't have any physical servers or you do not have any physical server on premise. Everything is on cloud. Thus, this is not a correct option. Now in part B, we have given all types of clouds. So we cannot choose this part as well because in public cloud, we cannot deploy physical servers. Hybrid cloud only. 
Now you can see that it's only talking about hybrid cloud. Of course, we can deploy physical servers on, in hybrid cloud as well because it's a combination of private and public cloud. So on private part, you can deploy your physical servers. But saying that only hybrid cloud is not a correct option. In part D, you are given with private cloud and hybrid cloud. And by now, you very well know that we can deploy physical servers both in private cloud and in hybrid cloud. Thus, the correct answer is option D. Moving on with our question number 66. This says that your company plans to migrate all its data and resources to Azure. The company's migration plan states that only PaaS solution must be used in Azure. You need to deploy Azure environment that meets the company's migration plan. The solution is that you create an Azure App Service and Azure SQL database. Does this meet the goal? The answer to question number 66 is yes. The reason being that both App Service and Azure SQL database are considered as PaaS offering. Thus, making the combination of both is also a pass offering so it's a yes moving on with question number 67 in this we have that your company plans to migrate all its data and resource to azure the company's migration plan states that only pass solution must be used in azure you need to deploy an azure environment that meets company's migration plan the solution given is that you create an Azure App Service and Azure Virtual Machine that have Microsoft SQL Server installed. Now you can see that question number 67 is similar to question number 66. The difference between both the question is the solution. In question number 65, now we are given with Azure App Service and Azure Virtual Machine that have Microsoft SQL Server installed. Now do not get confused because in this also we have Microsoft SQL Server and App Service and in here also we have App Service and Azure SQL database. Now in first glance they both look similar but pay attention here we have also virtual machines. Whenever we have virtual machine you can always be sure that we also have an element of infrastructure as a service. So now you can see that one part is infrastructure as a service and the other part is pass. However, the combination of both will not make it a pass offering on a whole. Thus, the correct answer for question number 67 is a no. Moving on with our question number 68. Your company plans to migrate all its data resource to Azure. Now I will not read the question again because it's similar to 66 and 67. Let's jump to the solution directly. It says that you create an Azure Virtual Machine and Azure Storage Account. Again, Azure Virtual Machine is always equal to infrastructure as a service. Thus, the combination of both does not make a pass. So the answer for this question is a no as well. Now let's begin with our question number 69. The first statement says to achieve a hybrid cloud model, a company must always migrate from a private cloud model. Pay attention that this talks about always. So it's not always necessary that you have to migrate from a private cloud model to achieve a hybrid cloud model. In the other cases, you can actually start from a public cloud model and add your own premises, network capabilities or hardware capabilities and become a hybrid model. So it's not always necessary to migrate from a private cloud model. Thus, the answer for this statement is a no. Moving on with the second statement. It says that a company can extend its capacity of internal network by using a public cloud. So the answer for this statement is a yes. Of course, a company can extend its internal network by using 
public cloud and thus it becomes a hybrid cloud model because now it's using both public cloud and internal network capabilities. Moving on with the third statement, it says that in a public cloud model, only guest users at your company can access the resources in cloud. The answer for this statement is a no, because not only guest users, but anyone who has access to the Active Directory can be given access to the resources in your cloud. Thus, the answer is a no. Moving on to question number 70, which will be the last question for part 5. The first statement says, a platform as a service solution provides full control of operating system that hosts applications. The answer for this one is no. Why? Because behind the scene, platform as a service which provides you a platform, but it doesn't give you a real control over operating systems. So the answer is no. The second statement says platform as a service solution provides additional memory to apps by changing pricing tier. Before answering this statement, I would like to read the third statement as well. A platform as a service solution can automatically scale the number of instances. Now to answer both of these statements, I will take you to the Microsoft site. Here I am on the Microsoft site that talks about scale up an app in Azure App Service. There are two important concepts here. First one is scale up and second one is scale out. Scale up actually relates to more CPU, memory, disk space and extra features like dedicated virtual machines, custom domains and certificate, staging slot, auto scaling and many more. Important here in scale up is that you can add CPU, memory and disk space along with extra features. So keep that in mind. Coming to scale out, scale out means increase the number of VM instances that run your app. Keep this word instances in mind when we will reach to the PowerPoint again. Reading out, you can scale out as many as 30 instances depending upon your pricing tier. That's another keyword that you need to keep in mind. So first keyword was uh, instances and the second keyword is pricing tier. Now let's jump back to our PPT. As we learned from the Microsoft site, scale up means adding more memory to the apps by changing pricing tier. So the platform as a service does provide this feature. So the answer for this one is yes. Then we also learned about scale out. Scale out means scaling or increasing number of instances in your app. Then we learned about scale out, which talks about scaling your applications by adding number of instances. And that's exactly what this statement demands. Thus, the answer for this statement is a yes as well. So this brings to an end of our 15 question series of part 5. I hope you like the set of 15 questions that we covered in part 5. If you have any specific question that you want to discuss, then do let me know in the comment section below and I will answer all of your questions. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. Today is our part 6 and we are going to cover another set of 15 questions from question number 71 to question number 85. These questions will not only increase your cloud understanding, but also will boost your passing score for AZ-900 exam. Earlier in this series, a lot has happened and we have already covered 70 questions spread across five parts. You don't want to miss these parts as you never know that which question will encounter in your exam. 
links for all these parts are given below in the description box below let's start with our part six <music> Starting with question number 71. The question says that Azure Site Recovery provides Dash for virtual machines. Is it a fault tolerance, disaster recovery, elasticity, or is it high availability? To answer this question, let me take you to the Microsoft site. So here I am on the Microsoft site that talks about Site Recovery. Here you can see that they have given details about Site Recovery and what does it mean and how can you use it. Coming a little down, if you scroll down a little, here is a section that talks about virtual machines. Now it talks about that you can set up disaster recovery of Azure virtual machines from primary region to a secondary region. Pay attention, the word here is disaster recovery. Coming back to our PPT, now you know the answer. The correct answer for this question number 71 is disaster recovery. Now quickly move to our question number 72. The question says that your company hosts an accounting application named App1 that is used by all the customers of the company. App1 has lower usage during the first three weeks of each month and very high usage during the last week of each month. Which benefit of cloud services support cost management for this usage pattern? Now you have to understand few key points here. It talks about that the application has lower usage in the first three weeks and it has a higher usage during the last week. Essentially, the question is demanding you to devise or suggest a mechanism which can encounter or take care of this fluctuation in demand. So do you think the answer is high availability or high latency, elasticity or load balancing? We have talked about all these features in our previous parts as well. So go check out our previous parts for more details on each of these terms. To answer this question better, let me take you to the Microsoft again. So here is the site that talks about elastic computing or cloud elasticity. This sites tell you that elastic computing is the ability to quickly expand or decrease computing power, memory, storage resources to meet changing demand without worrying about capacity planning and engineering for peak usage. Now try to relate the question with this definition of elastic computing. The definition is suggesting you that elastic computing does care of increase and decrease in computer processing, memory or storage resources. Now if you come to the PPT again, our question also demand that during the first three weeks, it's a low usage and high usage is during the last week. Thus, the correct answer for this question is elasticity. Now let's read out the question number 73. The question says that you have an on-premise network that contains 100 servers. You need to recommend a solution that provides additional resources to your users. The solution must minimize capital and operational expenditure costs. What should you include in the recommendation? Should you include a complete migration to public cloud or an addition data center or a private cloud or a hybrid cloud? Coming to the first option, a complete migration to the public cloud. This is not possible because the question asks that you will still hold on-premise network and you just want to provide additional resource to your users. Thus, complete migration to public cloud is not a correct option. Then additional data center is also not a correct option because the question says that you have to devise a solution that minimize capital expenditure as well. And setting up an additional data center demands a huge capital expenditure. So that's not a correct option either. Setting up a private cloud is also not a correct option because we want to minimize both capital and operational expenditure. Thus, the only correct answer for this question is a hybrid cloud because it's only the hybrid cloud that allows you to keep using your on-premise resources while you can also leverage additional resources on a public cloud. So the correct answer is hybrid cloud. 
let's move on to question number 74. So as you can see, you are given some terms here as dynamic scalability, low latency, fault tolerance and disaster recovery. You have to match these terms with the definitions given on the right hand side. So let's look out the first definition given here. The first definition says a cloud service that remain available after a failure occurs. Now you have to tell which of these four terms actually suits this definition. The correct answer for the first term is fault tolerance. So yes, fault tolerance is the ability of your cloud services to remain available even after failure occurs. The second definition says a cloud service that can be recovered after a failure occurs. Here the important keyword is recovered. So the correct answer for this definition is disaster recovery. Then we have third definition which says a cloud service that can be accessed quickly from the internet. The keyword here is accessed quickly. And the correct answer for this statement is low latency. Then at the last we have a cloud service that performs quickly when demand increases. So here the important keyword is that your cloud service should perform quickly or scale up quickly when your demand is increasing. Thus the correct answer for this statement is dynamic scalability. And of course scalability as a word itself means that you increase something or scale something to a next level. That's why when the demand increases, what you essentially need to do is to scale up your cloud service. Now let's move to our question number 75. In this question, it says that your company has an on-premise network that contains multiple servers. The company plans to reduce the following administrative responsibility. First, the company wants to reduce managing permissions to share documents, then backing up application data, replace failed server hardware, then we have updating server operating system, and lastly, we have managing physical server security. Moving on, the question says that the company plans to migrate servers to Azure Virtual Machines. You need to identify which administrative responsibility will be eliminated after the planned migration. So keep in mind you are moving to Azure Virtual Machines. So now you have to tell that when you are moving your on-premise network that contains multiple servers to our Azure Virtual Machine, which of the responsibilities will be minimized. So will you be able to minimize replacing failed hardware or backing up application data, managing physical server security, updating server operating system or managing permission to the shared documents. Now in the previous slides also we have talked many times about Azure Virtual Machine. Azure Virtual Machine is infrastructure as a service. So in infrastructure as a service what you're doing is that you are not managing the real or underlying hardware yourself. That's the very crux or thought process of infrastructure as a service. Keeping that thought uh, in mind, let's look at the correct answers. The correct answers are replacing failed server hardware. And that's exactly what I said that whenever you're moving to cloud IAS or infrastructure as a service, you are not maintaining any hardware. The hardware is always maintained by the cloud provider. And of course, when the hardware is maintained by them, that essentially means that in case there is a failed or faulty hardware, then they will change it or replace it. So you don't have to worry about that responsibility. The second correct answer is managing physical server security. So now that the cloud provider itself is taking care of the entire data center which actually includes the physical server security as well. So that's also the responsibility of the cloud provider. You are not doing that. You are not bothered about that. So these two are the correct answers. Replacing failed server hardware and managing physical 
server security. Keep in mind that you still have to do backup of your application data or update server operating system or managing permission to the shared documents. Now let's move to question number 76. It's a yes to kind of question. Let's read the first statement. The first statement says that an Azure subscription can be associated to multiple Azure Active Directory Azure AD tenants. Is it a yes or a no? Let's explore Microsoft site to find the answer. On this page, you can read out, it's clearly marked that multiple subscriptions can trust the same Azure AD directory. Each subscription can only trust a single directory. Mind it, it says once again, each subscription can only trust a single directory. However, in our question or statement, it says that Azure subscription can be associated with multiple Azure Active Directory. Thus, the answer for this one is a no. It can trust only and only one Azure AD directory. Coming on to the second statement. This says that you can change Azure Active Directory tenant to which an Azure subscription is associated. Simply putting it, it's just saying that for an Azure subscription, can you change its Azure Active Directory? Once again, coming to the Microsoft site. Now, if you read this article, which says transfer an Azure subscription to a different Azure Directory. So you can already see that yes, there is a possibility of transferring Azure subscription to a different Azure AD directory. So here it says that each subscription is associated with a particular Azure directory that we saw in the last statement as well. And then to make it easier, you might want to transfer a subscription to a different Azure directory. This means that yes, there is a possibility to change or to transfer Azure subscription to a different Azure AD directory. Thus, the answer for this one is a yes. Now coming to the third statement, which says that when an Azure subscription expires, the associated Azure Active Directory, Azure AD tenant is deleted automatically. So what happens is that when your subscription expires, you actually lose all the, all the resources that are associated with the subscription. However, the Azure AD or the Azure AD directory still remains in Azure and you can actually associate and manage the directory by using a different subscription. So this means what? That Azure AD tenant is not deleted automatically. So the answer for this one is a no. Moving on with our question number 77. Reading out the first statement, it says a company can extend private cloud by adding its own physical server to the public cloud. Well, this is a wrong statement altogether because we already know and we have discussed this many times in the previous questions as well, that in public cloud, the ownership of deploying servers, maintaining upkeep of those servers, physical security, all these are the responsibility of the cloud provider you have no authority or no interference in these kind of server deployments. Thus, the answer for this one is no. Then the second statement says, to build a hybrid cloud, you must deploy resources to the public cloud. Now first understand very briefly what is a hybrid cloud. Hybrid cloud is a combination of both public and private cloud. So you have on-premises uh, resources on network already working servers are there already working on your own premise and then you extend uh, that ability of resources by taking leverage on the public cloud so thus you can already understand by the bare definition of hybrid cloud that yes hybrid cloud only comes into existence when you deploy resources to the public cloud so the answer for this one is yes then moving on, the third statement says a public cloud must be disconnected from internet. See, it's not true that private cloud is disconnected from internet. Private cloud can and I think in fact most of the private cloud are connected to internet. It's just that private cloud 
means that you are maintaining the server's security and upkeep of the servers by yourself or maybe by, by your company. So it doesn't mean that private cloud has to be disconnected from the internet. Thus, the answer for this statement is no. Moving on with question number 78. You have 150 virtual machines hosted on-premise and 100 virtual machines hosted in Azure. Both on-premise virtual machines and Azure virtual machines are connected to each other. Which type of cloud model is this? Is this a hybrid, a private or a public cloud? I have told you many times that whenever there is an element or resources that are deployed both on-premise and on Azure network, then you must always choose hybrid as an answer. And that's exactly what is the correct answer for this question as well. Then moving on with question number 79, you have to identify the type of failure for which an Azure availability zone can be used to protect access to Azure service. What should you identify? Should you go for a physical server failure? Does Azure availability zone protect you from a physical server failure? Or is it an Azure region failure or a storage failure or an Azure data center failure? Coming on to the first option, this is not correct because physical server is not guaranteed by Azure availability zone. In fact, if we are talking about physical server failure, that essentially mean that we are talking about on-premise resources. Thus, that is not supported by Azure availability zone. So this is not a correct option. Then an Azure region failure. Now guys, keep in mind that a region, an Azure region can contain multiple availability zones. Now here is the Microsoft site that talks about regions and availability zone. So in here, you can read about regions and availability zones as well. If you scroll down a little, you can see that one Azure region here. You can see that one Azure region can contain multiple availability zones. Thus, you cannot protect a region failure by using availability zones. Thus, Azure region failure is not an correct option. Well, storage failure is also not the type of failure which Azure availability zone can be used to protect you. Thus, the only correct option for this question is Azure data center failure. So an Azure availability zone can be used to protect whenever you encounter an Azure data failure. Friends, it takes a considerable amount of effort to collect Microsoft links and documentation to support each answer. If you appreciate this effort, then don't miss to subscribe to the channel and give me a like. I always long for your comments and feedback, so don't miss on them as well. Now let's move on to question number 80. The question says that evaluate the underlying text to determine if it's correct. Let's read out. One of the benefits of Azure Synapse is that high availability is built into the platform. Now, the instructions are that if underlying text, this is the underlying text, makes the statement correct, then you have to select no change needed. However, if you think that this is not a correct statement, then you have to choose either of these options to make this statement correct. To answer this question correctly, let me tell you that Azure Synapse is a pass offering or platform as a service offering. And like any other platform as a service offering, high availability is built into this platform. So this statement is correct. The underlying, the underlying text Azure Synapse is correct. It has the high availability built into it. So the correct option is no change needed. One very important thing I want to tell you guys that Azure Synapse is evolved from Azure Data Warehouse. So in case in the question, it is mentioned um, Azure Data Warehouse instead of Azure Synapse, then also you have to go for no change needed. So keep in mind, Azure Synapse is an evolved version of Azure SQL Data Warehouse. If you want to read more about Azure Synapse, you can drop into this page and read about more on Azure Synapse. 
you can actually see what I mentioned was that what happened to Azure SQL Warehouse. And it says that Azure Synapse is Azure SQL Data Warehouse evolved. And that's exactly what I was trying to tell you that in case the question replaces Azure Synapse with Azure SQL Data Warehouse, you don't need to get confused. Always choose the right option. And as you saw, the right option is no change needed. Moving on with question number 81. This one says that your company plans to deploy several custom applications to Azure. The applications will provide invoicing services to the customer of the company. Each application will have several prerequisite applications and services installed. You need to recommend a cloud deployment solution for all the applications. What should you recommend? If you are reading the question in between the lines, then you can see the question is giving you very good amount of hints. It already says that you need to deploy a custom application to Azure. Further, it says that you would need to deploy a lot of prerequisite applications and services as well. So essentially, the question is trying to say that whenever you are deploying this application, you would need a high degree of customization. The only service that provide you a greater control or should I say the greatest control in terms of customization is none other than infrastructure as a service. Coming to question number 82, it says that you plan to deploy several Azure virtual machines. You need to ensure that the services running on the virtual machines are available even if a single data center fails. The solution is that you deploy the virtual machines to a scale set. Does this meet the goal? Before answering this question, I would like to see the other variations of these questions that might come in the AZ-900 exam. So you are prepared even if any other variation comes. So let's check out question number 83. The question is exactly the same. However, the solution is that you deploy virtual machines to two or more resource group. The third variation for the same question is question number 84. But this time the solution is that you deploy virtual machines to two or more regions. Coming to the first solution, it says that you want to deploy Azure virtual machines on scale set. To tell you more about Scaleset, Scaleset actually lets you create and manage a group of load balanced virtual machine. So it has nothing to do with providing you uh, a mechanism in case of failure of a uh, data center. Coming to the resource group, resource group is actually a logical collection of Azure resources. For example, virtual machines or storage account or any other Azure resources for that matter. So resource group is kind of a folder, uh, you can visualize that. So where you keep related files inside it. So uh, and definitely resource group are also nothing to do with uh, failures of data center. In the third one, it says that you deploy virtual machines on two or more regions. Definitely because whenever you're deploying Azure virtual machines on multiple region, it does ensure that the services running on the virtual machines are available even if single data center fails because now you have virtual machine spread across two or more regions. With that understanding, let's answer question number 82. The obvious answer to question number 82 is no. Then the answer for question number 83 is a no as well. Moving on, we have question number 84 and we understood that whenever you deploy virtual machine on two or more regions, that ensures that your services are running even if single data center fails. So the answer for this one is yes. Moving on with our last question of part six, we have question number 85. This one says that Azure Cosmos DB is an example of what? Is it a pass offering, uh, infrastructure as a service or IAS offering? Is it a serverless or is it a software as a service? To answer this question, let me take you to the Microsoft site. So coming to the Microsoft documentation, it talks about security in Azure Cosmos DB. So if you scroll down a little here under this heading, which says, how do I secure my database? 
let's read one of the lines here it says that if you choose a pass cloud database provider such as azure cosmos db now i'm sure that just by reading this line you can decide that azure cosmos db is a pass offering thus the correct answer for question number 85 is platform as a service definitely cosmos db is platform as a service i hope you like all the 15 questions that we covered in part 6 of our az 900 real exam question and answer series if so appreciate my efforts by giving me a like and a subscribe if this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to The Tech Blackboard. Today is part 7 of our Easy 900 real exam question and answer series. A total of 15 power pack questions awaits you from question number 86 to question number 100. For those who are new to this channel, don't miss to press that subscribe button, hit that bell icon to receive all the notifications. New videos are uploaded every week. If you are liking my videos and my efforts, please consider pressing that like button. Don't miss to watch earlier six parts of this series as they have covered very important questions and concepts that will surely go a long way to level up your overall AZ-900 scores. The links for all these six parts are given below in the description box. So let's start our part 7. Starting with question number 86. In these kind of questions, what you have to tell is whether this statement is correct or not. So the question says that resource group provides organizations with the ability to manage compliance of Azure resources across multiple subscription. So do you think this statement is correct or do you need some changes to make it correct? For example, if you think this statement is correct, then you have to choose no change needed. However, if you feel that this statement is not correct and resource group is uh, not something that can provide this ability, then you have to choose out of these three options. So let me first tell you what is a resource group. So you can think a uh, resource group as a container that holds resources for an Azure solution. Now it's important to understand that resource group can potentially hold all the resources for your solution but i would say that's not a good practice because uh, in one resource group you would want to keep uh, resources that are idly somehow connected so let me give you an example let's say you have a big company and in these uh, and in this company you have different departments for example finance or hr and let's say you want to control the cost based on these different departments so what you will do is you will create a resource group that will only hold resources that are consumed by HR department. Similarly, you will create another resource group that will hold resources only used by finance department. So resource group is more to manage resources in an easier way. Okay. So this means that this statement is not correct. Uh, now let's see what are the other options. The other options are management groups, Azure policies and Azure app services. Now let me first tell you what is the correct option. The correct answer for this statement is management group. Before I show you the proof of the answer, you have to keep some of the keywords in mind. So for example, here it says that you need some ability to manage compliance of Azure resources across multiple subscription. Keep this in mind, multiple subscription. Now here I am on the Microsoft site and this page talks about management group. So if you read the first line, it says that management groups are containers that help you manage access policies and compliance across multiple subscription. And that's exactly what our question is asking. So the management group is a correct option, but 
it's important that you understand that why I have not chosen Azure policies uh, or Azure app service. See, Azure policies actually help you to enforce organizational standards or, or compliance. Um, you can say the use cases for uh, Azure policy includes implement governance for resources, uh, consistency, regulatory compliance or security, cost management, and these things. So uh, that's what Azure policy is used for. Thus, Azure policies is not the correct option. See, app services is something when you, whenever you want to deploy or run your mobile app or a web app in Azure, then you use Azure app services for that. Thus, the only correct option for this question is management grow. Moving on with our 87th question, it says that your company plans to migrate to Azure. The company has several departments. All the Azure resource used by each department will be managed by a department administrator. What are the two possible techniques to segment Azure for the departments? I told you what are resource group and resource group are essentially uh, something as a container acts as a container to keep the uh, related resources in a group. And then I also told you that if you have different departments, then you can use Azure resource group to manage the resources related to that department. And this question is also related or on those lines only. The correct answer for question number 87 is multiple subscription and multiple resource group. So you create multiple subscription. Why I'm saying multiple subscription? Because subscription is tied with your billing. So your billing, if the billing in Azure runs on the level of subscription, and in a subscription, you want to keep related resources together. That's why we have chosen multiple resource groups. So these two are the correct option. Coming to the other two ones, the Azure Active Directory is majorly related to your authorization and authentication. Regions are primarily used when you want to build high availability. So it has nothing to do what is the ask in the question. So let's move to our question number 88. In the question number 88, it says that you plan to store 20 TB of data in Azure. The data will be accessed infrequently and visualized by using Power BI. You need to recommend a storage solution for the data. Which two solutions should you recommend? Now, the keyword in this question is 20 TB. So we are talking about big data. Before I show you the correct answer, it's important that you understand that Power BI actually can connect to all of these. So uh, according to the new capabilities of Power BI, it can connect to Data Lake, Cosmos DB and Synapse Analytics as well. However, the keyword, the prime keyword here is 20 TB of data. And that's what that will guide us to our answer. The correct answer for this one is Azure Data Lake and Azure CNAP Analytics, because these are the database that can hold a large amount of data. So that's why I have chosen these two options. Coming to question number 89, it's a yes, no kind of question. So let's read out the first statement. The first statement says that Azure resources can only access other resources in the same Azure group. So is this a yes or is this a no? The correct answer for this one is no. It's not correct because Azure resource can access resources in the other resource group as well. See, as I told you in the question number 86 as well, that Azure resource group is just a virtual boundary. It's not a physical boundary that you cannot jump into the other resource group to access them from one resource group. So if you have two resource group, uh, resource group A and resource group B, then the resources which are in resource group A can very well access the resources in resource group B. Thus, the correct answer is no. Then the second statement says that if you delete a resource group, all the resources in the resource group will be deleted. It's very important that you keep related resources in a resource group. And what happens that whenever you are deleting a resource group, all the resources are deleted, which were under that resource group. In fact, this is the most efficient way of deleting your resources. So for example, I will give you a, a use case, which I use normally in practical life as well. 
So whenever I am working on a solution and uh, let's say I want to uh, test something or you know I'm trying to do some research uh, in something. What I essentially do is create a separate resource group and then create all the resources that I need in same resource group. For example, I would create a virtual machine, a storage and any other resource that I would need to implement the solution or implement some test. Uh, once I'm done with it, when once I'm over, then I would just delete the resource group. I don't need to bother and go delete each and every resource separately. This is the best and efficient way whenever you are actually working in Azure. Thus, the answer for this one is yes. Yes, if you delete a resource group, all the resources in that resource group will be deleted. Moving on with the third statement, it says a resource group can contain resources from multiple Azure region. The correct answer for this one is yes. Of course, a resource group can contain resources from multiple Azure regions. I mean, that's what we have learned in the previous questions as well. So the correct answer is yes. Moving on with our question number 90, which again is a yes, no kind of question. The question says that with software as a service SaaS, you must apply software updates. So is it a yes or a no? The correct answer is no. In software as a service, you just use the service. You don't have to take care of software updates or security patches or peripheral security. Nothing is under your responsibility. All of that is actually taken care by the cloud provider. To give you more clarity on software as a service, here I am on the Microsoft page. Now, if you will read and understand the common examples of software as a service, you will already understand the answer. So it says that common examples are email, calendaring, office tools like Office 365. So I'm sure that all of you must have used these tools and I'm also sure that you have never applied any software patches or upgrades whenever you're using these kind of uh, email or calendaring service. You just use these tools and nothing else. So the correct answer is no. Moving on with the second statement, it says with infrastructure as a service IAS, you must install the software that you want to use. The correct answer is yes. So you can say software as a service is on one end where you don't do anything except for using the software uh, and IAS is on the other end where uh, right from the operating systems. Uh, to maintaining patches and these kind of things all comes under your responsibility. So you have to install the software that you want to use and it's actually what IAS is used for. It gives you greater flexibility when it comes to custom solutions. So you can install your custom application, your custom softwares on infrastructure as a service. You can read more about infrastructure as a service on this page. Coming to the third statement, it says Azure Backup is an example of platform as a service. The correct answer is yes. Yes, Azure Backup is definitely an example of platform as a service. Want to read more about platform as a service? Come on to this page and you can read a whole lot of information about platform as a service. And friends, as always, all the links that I'm using in this video will surely be given in the description box below. Coming to question number 91. Let's read out the first statement. It says that you can create a resource group inside of an another resource group. The correct answer for this one is no. The reason being that you are not allowed to create nested resource group. You cannot create a resource group inside a resource group. That is not allowed. Moving on with our second statement, it says an Azure virtual machine can be in multiple resource group. See, understand it in this way. Let's say you have a file. Can you put a file, a single file into different folders? I'm not talking about making multiple copies. I'm just talking about the copy that you have. Can you put in multiple locations? Of course not. One single file can only be present in one single folder. Similarly, if you have one virtual machine or for that matter, any other resource, you cannot put that resource into multiple resource groups. It will always be present in a single resource group. 
Thus, the answer for this one is no. The third statement says that a resource group can contain resources from multiple Azure regions. The correct answer for this one is yes. Yes, of course, a resource group can contain resources from multiple Azure regions. If you want to learn more about resource group in Azure portal, then this is a good page. Amongst this list, it's interesting that you also read about this move to another resource group or subscription and how you can attain lock uh, on the resource group. It's an interesting concept of lock where you can put a lock on some resource group level as well. Um, and then that resource group would not be accidentally uh, deleted. So good thing to understand because it will come handy when you are actually working with Azure. So interesting page to read on. Now moving on with our question number 92. In this question, it says building a data center infrastructure is an example of operational expenditure, OPEX cost. Is it a yes or a no? The correct answer is no. Monthly salaries for technical person are an examples of operational OPEX cost. The correct answer is yes. Leasing software is an example of operational expenditure or operational cost. So the correct answer is again a yes. Now in here, I would like to give you a tip. So how you can judge or conclude if that's an operational cost or a capex or capital expenditure. It's very easy. Whenever these kind of questions comes, what you need to essentially ask yourself is whether. Uh, so if the cost is recurring, then it's it's always operational cost. OK, so for example, your salary, your mobile bills, your Netflix subscription or your prime subscription, all these are recurring costs. You are you are giving that cost on a monthly basis. So on the other hand, if it's only a one time cost, OK, a one time cost is always associated with CAPEX or capital expenditure. For example, when you are building a data center, what kind of cost is this? You are incurring a huge upfront cost to build a data center. You have to put a lot of money to bring it huge servers, storage machines, racks and lot of networking cables and every other things. So it's a huge capex cost, upfront cost, one time cost is there. That's why we have chosen a no here. However, in the other statements, it says that monthly salaries. As I told you, you are paying these salaries monthly. It's not that you pay your employee or person one time salary and he's happy. No, that's not going to happen. You have to pay them monthly for their service. Similarly, for leasing software, you pay a cost uh, on a monthly basis or maybe in a six months or maybe yearly, depending upon the uh, lease that you have purchased. So that's why it's again a recurring cost. That's why it's a yes. So with that quick tip, let's move to our next question. The next one is question number 93. Let's read out the first statement. This one says a platform as a service solution that hosts web apps in Azure provides full control of operating system that hosts the applications. The correct answer for this one is no, because in pass as a service, you don't have full control over the operating systems. If you want the full control, then you should deploy your solution on IAS or infrastructure as a service. Moving on with the next statement, we have platform as a service solution that hosts web apps in Azure can be provided with additional memory by changing the pricing tier. The correct answer for this statement is yes. Yes, the web apps that are hosted on platform as a service, you they can be actually provided with additional memory by changing the pricing tier. So correct answer is yes. Then moving on, we have the third statement that says that platform as a service solution that hosts web apps in Azure can be configured to automatically scale number of instances based on demand. The correct answer for this one is again a yes, because see a past solution that hosts web apps in Azure does provide the ability to scale the platform automatically and this ability of automatic scaling is actually known as auto scaling. Moving on with our question number 94. In this kind of question, you have to drag 
the options given on the left side to match the statement given on the right hand side. Now let's read the first statement. This one says that no required capital expenditure. So now you have to tell that in what kind of cloud you don't require capital expenditure. Is it hybrid or private or public cloud? The correct answer for this one is public cloud. So whenever you are moving to public cloud, all the uh, you don't have to build the infrastructure or buy servers or virtual machines or any other hardware. You don't have to build any data center. So thus you don't require any capital expenditure. And that's the correct answer for this statement, public cloud. Moving on, the second statement says provides complete control over security. Now, if you want complete control over security, I mean, of course, cloud solution in itself are very secure. But yes, if you have some custom security needs uh, that you think that are not available in public cloud, then you have to go for the solution, which is private cloud. So private cloud provides you ability to have greater control over the security. Thus, that's the answer. Now, the third statement says provides a choice to use on premises and cloud based resources. And of course, the answer here is hybrid cloud. So what happens in hybrid cloud is you keep using your on premise resources. However, if you want extra power or extra uh, memory or storage or anything, then you leverage on the cloud based resources. That's the uh, hybrid cloud model. Friends, before we move ahead, if my efforts are helping you learn the cloud better and score good marks in certification, then don't miss to subscribe to the channel. So you are not missing any important video. Do press that bell icon and give me a like and share this video to the maximum you can. Now let's move to question number 95. The first statement in this question says that an Azure subscription can be associated to multiple Azure Active Directory, Azure AD tenants. The correct answer for this one is no. Because an Azure Active Directory tenant can have multiple subscription, but an Azure subscription can only be associated with one Azure Active Directory tenant. So it's very important that you keep this association or hierarchy in mind whenever you are answering these kind of questions. Moving on with our next statement, we have you can change the Azure Active Directory, Azure AD tenant to which an Azure subscription is associated. Basically, the statement is asking you whether you can move your Azure subscription to another Azure Active Directory or not. The correct answer for this one is yes, of course you can do that. Here I am on the Microsoft page that tells you more about transfer and Azure subscription to a different Azure AD directory. So the heading itself gives you an idea that of course this is possible to move uh, Azure subscription to a different Azure AD directory. You, you can read more on how to do that and achieve that uh, on this page. Continuing with our third statement, it says that when an Azure subscription expires, the associated Azure Active Directory tenant is deleted automatically. Now here friends, you have to understand that if, you, if your subscription expires, you essentially lose all the resources that are associated with the subscription. However, even if the subscription has expired, Azure Active Directory still stays there. In fact, you can still associate and manage the directory using different Azure subscription. Thus, the correct answer for this statement is no. Moving on with our question number 96. This one says that a company can extend a private cloud by adding its own physical server to public cloud. Now, it's important that you understand and read the question very carefully because sometimes it can be really confusing and Microsoft is very smart to confuse you at many places. So here it actually saying you that can you extend your private cloud by adding your physical server to the public cloud. We have read this and understood this many times that in public cloud, the infrastructure or the servers are not in your control. All is managed by the cloud provider himself. So the correct answer for this one is no. You cannot deploy your own physical servers on public cloud. Moving on with the second statement, we have to build a hybrid cloud, you must deploy resources to public cloud. 
we have read this many times that hybrid cloud is a combination of public and private or you can also say on premises so of course in order to gain the hybrid cloud you must deploy resources to the public cloud thus the correct answer for this statement is yes moving on with the third statement we have a private cloud must be disconnected from the internet well you have to understand that private cloud does not mean that it is not connected to internet of course in fact i would i believe that all private clouds more or less are connected to internet it's just that in private cloud the infrastructure is your own it doesn't have to be disconnected from the internet thus the correct answer for this one is no next we have is question number 97 this one says that which Azure service should you use to collect events from multiple resources into a centralized repository? The correct answer for this one is Azure Event Hubs. The reason why I have chosen Azure Event Hubs because I am concentrating on the keywords which says to collect events from multiple resources. Now many times you might get confused why not Azure Monitor. This I will explain when we are taking question number 99. Here we are on the Microsoft site where you can read more about Azure Event Hubs. It says that Azure Event Hub is a big data streaming platform and event ingestion service. So you can see it's an event ingestion service. That's why I have chosen Azure Event Hub as an answer to this question. Moving on with question number 98. Here we have which Azure service provides a set of version control tools to manage the code. Is it Azure Repos, Azure DevTest Labs or Azure Storage or is it Azure Cosmos DB? Now the correct answer is Azure Repos. Sometimes you also call it Azure Repositories. In fact, the name itself suggests you that it's a kind of repository where you can manage the version of your codes that's why the correct answer is azure repos the other three options are not related to version control for example these two are databases and azure dev test lab is related to creating resources in an efficient or quicker way so this is also not related to version control and of course you can read more about azure repos on this page so it's a great page to come and learn about azure repos Moving on with our question number 99. This one says that you have a virtual machine named VM1 that runs on Windows Server 2016. VM1 is in East US Azure region. Which Azure service should you use from the Azure portal to view service failure notifications that can affect the availability of VM1? Here the keywords are that you need to view the service failure. Now, as I gave the reference of question number 99 in this question number 97, the difference is here you wanted to collect events. However, here you want to view the service failure. Thus, the correct answer for question number 99 is Azure Monitor. So I hope you got the drift of why I chose the answer as Azure Monitor here and why Azure Event Hub here. If you want to learn more about Azure Monitor, this is the Microsoft page where you can get an overview of Azure Monitor, how it helps to collect insights or telemetry from different Azure resources and much more. Now let's move on with our question number 100. If you're still with me, give yourself a round of applause. This is our last question for part seven of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. This one says that you have to complete the sentence An availability zone in Azure has physical separate location. You have to tell whether it has physical separate locations across two continents within a single Azure region, within multiple Azure regions or within a single Azure data center. The correct answer for this one is within a single Azure region. Now here I am on the Microsoft page that talks more about regions and availability zones. You can read more about regions and availability zone here, but the part where I'm most interested is, is this image. Here you can see that Azure region here. So this is an entire Azure region and these are multiple availability zones. So the hierarchy is that under one Azure region, you have multiple availability zones. 
or in other words we can say an availability zone in azure has physically separate locations within a single azure region if this video has added any value in your learning a like and subscribe is highly appreciated share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and i look forward for them we will meet again in our next video till then stay fit keep learning and thanks for watching hello and welcome back to the tech blackboard this is our part 8 of our az900 real exam question and answer series in this part, we are going to cover another 15 power packed questions from question number 101 to question number 115. Earlier in this series, we have already covered 100 questions split across 7 parts. So if you have missed any of these parts, I would strongly recommend that you go and check out every part of this series because you don't know which question out of these parts will come in your Microsoft exam. So do not miss even a single part. Starting with our question number 101. This one says that which of the following is an example of IAS or infrastructure as a service. So you can see there are lot of services given here. For example, compute, storage, networking, security and many more. Now you have to tell that which one of these fall under the category of infrastructure as a service. The correct answer for this one is all of them. Yes, of course, all of these services fall under the category of infrastructure as a service. So friends, these kind of questions are important in the sense that you at least know what all services fall under which different categories. IAS, PaaS or SaaS offerings because there are a lot of questions that come from this area. You can read a lot more about Microsoft infrastructure as a service here on this page from Microsoft. If you will scroll down, you can see all these services which I just showed you in the PPT. So all these services fall under the category of infrastructure as a service. Now let's begin with our question number 102. This one is a yes no kind of question. So first of all, I will take you through all the statements. Then I will give you the answers. And then finally, I will take you to the Azure portal to show everything in practical. Now let's start with the first statement. The first statement says that from Azure Service Health, an administrator can view the health of all the services in an Azure environment. The correct answer for this one is yes. Yes, you can use Azure Service Health to view all the service related health issues in an Azure environment. It's very important that you know, friends, that when we are talking about Azure Service Health, it's not to be confused by something that can give alerts or uh, through which you can monitor the problems with your own deployed solution. It's not that. For example, let's say you have deployed a data factory and data factory, the pipeline ran into an error. So Azure service health, you cannot watch or monitor the logs of that particular pipeline. Okay, so it's not about your application or your services. So what do you use Azure service health for? Azure service health, you use to see the uh, health of all the services and the regions that you are using. Okay, so for example, you can see the outages, the plan maintenance activities or other health advisories. So this is what Azure Service Health is used for. Moving on with our second statement, it says that from Azure Service Health, an administrator can create a rule to be alerted if an Azure service fail. The correct answer for this one is yes. Moving on with the third statement we have from Azure Service Health, an administrator can prevent a service failure. The correct answer for this one is no. As I mentioned before, the Azure Service Health is essentially just a window, just a monitor that you can use to see the outages or planned maintenance. So now let me take you to the Azure portal to show you more about Azure Service Health. Now here I am on the Azure portal. Now if you go here and find Sir service health then you can see microsoft is giving you the suggestion this is the logo this heart shape uh, then if you click on it 
Now here on this Azure Service Health page, you can see if there are any problems with the or any outages with the services or the regions that you are using or if there are any planned maintenance or any health advisories or for that matter security advisories as well. The good part is you can also see the health history for all the services and regions that you are currently working with. And then as we saw in the second uh, statement, it asked that whether we can create alerts in Azure Service Health. So here you can see this option which says add service health alert. If you click on this option, so on this page you have information already filled up. For example, your subscription, the services, the regions. And then on this segment where it says event type, here you can see not only the service issue, you can also select for plan maintenance, you can select health advisories, you can select security advisories. So all of these you can select and build a alert for everything that you want. So I hope uh, with that quick glimpse on Azure portal, you now understand why we have chosen a yes for the first statement and why we chose a yes for the second and no for the third one. Now let's move on to question number 103. This one says that you have an Azure environment that contains 10 web apps to which URL should you connect to manage all the Azure resources? So here you are already given HTTPS and in the end you are given this .com and in between the two you have given, you have been given with two drop down menus and of these drop downs you have to select one options from each so that the URL is complete. Okay, so one important and interesting thing is that do not get confused by these things like for example 10 web apps or any other things that Microsoft gave. The crux of the question is that which URL should you hit when you want to access the Azure portal. Okay, so here I am on the Azure portal once again. Now let me open a tab and in the tab I will try to open the Azure portal. So watch carefully what address or URL I am typing in. So I am typing portal.azure.com and if I hit the enter you can see it takes me to the Azure portal because I'm already logged in. That's why it just opens my default page. So the correct answer for this question is, so the correct URL becomes HTTPS portal.azure.com. Before moving ahead, I just wanted to say that friends, if you're liking my efforts that goes in finding proper Microsoft documentation to justify each answer and giving you explanation for each question, then do encourage me by liking the videos and subscribing to the channel. Your each like will ensure that the videos are reaching to the greater audience. Your comments and feedbacks are very valuable for me and I make sure to read each one of them and answer them as well. Keep supporting me and I shall bring the very best of the content. Now let's quickly jump to the question number 104. The question says that you plan to extend your company network to Azure. The network contains a VPN appliance that uses an IP address of 121.108.100.1. You need to create an Azure resource that defines the VPN appliance in Azure. Which Azure resource should you create first to answer select the appropriate resource in the answer area. Now this can be a little bit of confusing question because you can see there are a lot of options and you must need to understand each of the option in relation to the statement given here. So before answering this question, let me take you to the Microsoft page and there we will understand in a better way how this setup is done. So now I am on the Microsoft page and here you can see it says that create a site-to-site -site VPN connection in Azure portal. Now let's read it out. It says that Azure VPN Gateway provides cross-premises connectivity between customer premise and Azure. And if you remember the statement correctly, we are in on-premise and now we want to extend to Azure portal. So it's very important that you understand where are we starting from and where we want to move. So we are starting from on-premise and we are moving to Azure Cloud and that's where we want to set up a site-to-site uh, -site VPN. So let's understand this diagram. 
and you can see the network itself is now subdivided into subnets and then we have this VPN tunnel, a VPN gateway and then we connect to the cloud. Okay, now the first step it says is local network device. Okay, and then we have public IP address. Now here you can learn how to do this. You first need to create a virtual network, then you have VPN gateway and then you set up a local network gateway. Keep that in mind. Then we have VPN connection. You verify the connection and then you connect to a virtual machine. It's an interesting page, a long page though. So you have to read it through. But the interesting part where I want you to focus is this one. Okay. So we have here create a local network gateway. So this section says that the local network gateway is a specific object that represents on premises location, the site for routing purposes. Here it's important to note that local network gateway is a specific object that represents your on premise location. Okay, rest you can read on this page. I have just shown you the page and the links for this page will be provided in the description box as well. So now let's move to the PPT and find out the answer. So as we just saw on the Microsoft page that the first step towards creating a site to site VPN is that we create a local network gateway and that's exactly the correct answer for this question. So these are important questions from the exam point of view because these are confusing first of all and then Microsoft can tweak the question. So you need to really understand uh, the question, what are the options given in the question and how those options fit into building some sort of VPN or a network. So please be very careful when you are reading or doing these kind of questions. Then moving on with our question number 105. This one says that your company plans to book several servers to Azure. The company's compliance policy states that a server named Fin server must be on a separate network segment. You are evaluating which Azure service can be used to meet the compliance policy requirement. Which Azure solution should you recommend? Should you recommend a resource group for Fin server and another resource group for all the other servers? Then the B part is a virtual network for Fin server and another virtual network for all other servers. The option C says a VPN for Fin server and a virtual network gateway for each other server. Option D is one resource group for all servers and resource group lock on Fin server. So which according to you is a correct answer to suit this statement. Now before I answer this question, let me tell you more about network in Azure. So a network in Azure is also known as virtual network. A virtual network can have multiple IP address space and multiple subnets. Now Azure automatically routes the traffic between the subnets within a virtual network. Now the question states that the fin server, the fin server here must be on a separate network. Now the only way to do this uh, in networking is to put the fin server on a different network and then rest of the server on a separate network. So that's the only feasible way through which we can achieve this statement. Thus, the correct answer for this question is option B, a virtual network for Fin server and another virtual network for all the other servers. If you are new to this channel, then let me tell you that I have started to give away the PDF version of these PPTs that I use in my videos. So if you are someone who is looking forward for the PDF version of this PPT that I'm using in part eight, then you have to tell me the answers for the question number 103, 108 and 115. For those who will answer all the questions right, then I will give you the PDF version of this PPT. Coming to the question number 106. This is again a yes, no kind of question. So let's read the first statement. The first statement says Azure PowerShell modules can be installed on Mac OS. 
Now here I am on the Microsoft documentation which talks about Azure PowerShell. In this paragraph you can read that AZ PowerShell module is based on .NET standard and works with PowerShell 7.0.6 LTS and PowerShell 7.1.3 or higher on all platforms including Windows, Mac OS and Linux. It is also compatible with Windows PowerShell 5.1. Thus, as you just saw on the Microsoft documentation page, yes, we can install PowerShell modules on Mac OS. So the correct answer is yes. Then the second statement says that Azure Cloud Shell can be accessed from a web browser on a Linux computer. And the correct answer for this one is yes. Yes, of course, you can access the Cloud Shell from a Linux computer. Friends, I don't have a Linux computer, but I can surely show you how a Cloud Shell or Azure Cloud Shell works. So here I am on the Microsoft Azure portal. So here you can see a small button which looks like a prompt. If you click on this button, then you can see a terminal window is getting open and it says requesting Cloud Shell. So this is exactly the Azure Cloud Shell which you can run from any browser whether it is on Microsoft Windows or Linux or on Mac OS. Now you can see it's connecting to the terminal. So it just takes a little while and then authentication is done. And then here, here you have the PowerShell running on your browser. Interesting part to know is that you can run both PowerShell and you can also run Bash as well. Thus the correct answer is Yes. Moving on with the third statement, we have the Azure portal can only be accessed from Windows device. The correct answer for this is no. Azure portal can be accessed from Linux, Mac OS and Windows of course. Now let's move to question number 107. The first statement of the question says that all the Azure resources deployed to a resource group must use same Azure region. Simply putting it, the question or the statement is saying that whenever you have a Azure resource group and you have a location attached to it, so all the resources that are deployed under that resource group should also be deployed in same Azure region as your resource group is. Now the correct answer for this statement is no. Because the resource group, it can have a different location and the resources inside that resource group can also have different locations. So both can have different location or same location. So there is no restriction or compulsion that all the resources inside the resource group must have the same location as that of the resource group. Now, let me tell you a very interesting fact about resource group. So essentially resource group it, they just contain metadata about the resources it contains. So whenever you create a resource, you have to provide a location. I think that that much we all know. So a location is essential whenever we create any kind of resource in Microsoft Azure. Now you must be wondering that if resource can have a different location as we saw in this statement as well, then why resource group even need a location? So this is a confusion with many people who start working on Azure. So it's a very simple thing. See the resource group, it just contains metadata. Now you have to store this metadata somewhere. So to store this metadata, you need to give a location to a resource group. That's it. That's the reason why you need to give a location when you are creating a resource group. I hope you like that interesting fact about resource group. Let me know in the comment section if you have more interesting fact about any of the resources of Microsoft Azure. Now let's move to the second statement which says that if you assign a tag to a resource group, all the Azure resources in that resource group are assigned to the same tag. The correct answer for this one is no. Now to justify the answer, here I am on the Microsoft documentation which talks more about Azure resource manager and if you scroll down a little you will reach to a section which talks more about 
resource groups and that's what our question is based on then a little more scrolling and then uh, here you will read a section which will be and now here if you concentrate on this section it says you can apply tax to resource group the resources in the resource group do not inherit those tax so whenever a resource group gets some tags or you apply some tags on resource group they do not descend to the resources in that resource group they don't inherit it by default coming back to the presentation the third statement says that if you assign permissions for a user to manage a resource group the user can manage all the azure resources in that resource group the correct answer for this statement is yes so unlike tags the tags do not inherit to the other resources in that resource group but in case of permissions when you are applying a generic permission to a resource group then that permission descends to the resources inside that resource group so the user can definitely manage all the resources in that resource group depending upon the permission that you have given so so for example if you have given a user a read only permission or let's say write permission or any other permission the same permission that you have given on the resource group level will also be inherited to all the resources inside that resource group so keep that in mind coming to the question number 108 this one says that a support engineer plans to perform several azure management tasks by using the azure cli you install the cli on the computer you need to tell the support engineer which tools to use to run cli which two tools should you instruct the support engineer to use now pay attention my friends that you have to use two tools sometimes it happens that people just select one option and then move ahead and they lose a precious one mark so while answering the question always pay attention how many options you have to choose while answering the question so the correct answer for this one is command prompt and the second answer is windows powershell the other three options that you can see here azure uh, resource explorer windows defender firewall or network and sharing center they are not even remotely related to running a cli thus the only correct options are option a and option c moving on with our question number 109 this one says that you have an azure environment you need to create a new virtual machine from a tablet that runs on the android operating system solution is you use powershell in azure cloud shell does this meet the goal now i want to show you more variations of this same question that you can expect in microsoft exam because of course microsoft keeps changing the pool of question so they bring more variations in the same question so that they can test you on your knowledge so let's check out the other variation of the same question the other variation in question number 110 is shown the question being the same the solution however says that that this time you use power apps portal even one more variation is in the question number 111 and this one says that you use bash in azure portal now which out of these three variations do you think has a correct answer so let's begin with question number 109 here we had powershell in azure cloud shell now in the question number 106 i showed you how to run azure cloud shell from a browser now in browser you can run two modes in azure cloud shell the one being powershell and the other being bash and you can run the browser from any operating system be it mac os or windows or linux or for that matter even android operating system it just have to be a browser in fact to tell you i also use sometimes for very small works though but sometimes i am using the azure cloud shell from my mobile browser and that's exactly what it asked android operating system so the correct answer for Question number 109 is yes, of course, you can run PowerShell in Azure Cloud Shell. Then moving on with 110, we have Power Apps. The correct answer for this one is 
No. Now it's interesting to note that Microsoft has given Power Apps here. Now Power Apps is basically it lets you create business application with little or no code. So do not get confused between Power Apps and PowerShell. Moving on with question number 111, the correct answer is yes. I already told you that you can run both Bash and PowerShell from Azure Cloud Shell. Coming to question number 112. This one says that you plan to map a network drive from several computers that run Windows 10 to Azure Storage. You need to create a storage solution in Azure for planned map drive. What should you create? So should you create an Azure SQL database or a virtual machine data disk or file service in Azure storage account or a blob storage in storage account? The correct answer for this question is option C, a file service in a storage account. It's important that you're noting that you are mapping from a network drive. So essentially we are talking about the on-premise of several computers and what are we mapping it to? We are mapping it to Azure storage. So from an on-premise network drive, you need to map this drive to a Azure storage. So this is what the requirement is. Now to justify the answer, here I am on the Microsoft documentation, which talks more about Azure files. Now here you can read that Azure files offers fully managed file shares in cloud that are accessible via industry standard SMB protocol or NFS protocol. It also says that Azure files shares can be mounted concurrently by cloud or on on-premise deployment. So it's important that you're noting that it can also be mounted on on-premise deployments. Also, it's good to read this line that it says that Azure files can be used to completely replace or supplement traditional on-premise file servers or NAS devices. Popular operating systems such as Windows, Mac OS, Linux can directly mount Azure file shares whenever they are in the world. So this means that you can use file service to map a network drive from several computers to Azure storage. Moving on with our question number 130. This one says that your company plans to start using Azure and will migrate all its network resource to Azure. You need to start the planning process by exploring Azure. What should you create first? So should you create a subscription? Should you create a resource group or a virtual network or a management group? The key point to note is what is the service that you will create first? If you have been watching my videos regularly, then I have told this many times that subscription is the thing that is associated or tied up with your billing. So whenever you're creating a Microsoft account, be it a free tier or pay as you go, then the first thing that you create is subscription. Because only once you have created the subscription, your billing starts and then only Microsoft will allow you to create any other resource. Thus, the correct answer for this question is subscription. Now coming to question number 114, data that is stored in archive access tier of an Azure account. You need to tell how you can access the data in the archive access tier. So can it be accessed anytime using azcopy.exe or can it only be read by using Azure Backup or it must be restored before the data can be accessed or it must be hydrated before the data can be accessed. Before I jump to the Microsoft documentation, it's important that you note that we are talking about archive access tier. So here I am on the Microsoft documentation talking about hot coal and archive access tier for blob data. Now here you can read more about all the different tiers. We have hot tier, cool tier, and then we have archive tier. If you scroll down this site a little, then you will reach to more details given on archive access tier. Now here in this section, in this paragraph, you can read that while a blob is in archive tier, it cannot be read or modified. To read or download a blob in archive tier, you must first rehydrate it to online tier either hot or cool. 
I hope reading through the Microsoft documentation already give you a fair idea of what is going to be the correct option for this question. So the correct answer is that it must be rehydrated before the data can be accessed. Now moving on with our question number 115, which is also our last question for our part 8 on our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. This one is like a fill in the blanks. This one says Dash is an Apache Spark based analytics service. So which out of these is the Apache Spark based analytics service? Is it Azure Databricks or Data Factory, Azure DevOps or Azure Synapse Analytics? The correct answer for this one is Azure Databricks. If you want to read more about Azure Databricks, then here is the Microsoft documentation. The link for this page is also available in the description box. I hope you like another set of 15 questions that we covered in this part 8. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning, and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. Well, today is our part 9 of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. As you can see that I have already updated the series with some of the latest questions. So in part 9, we are going to cover 15 very important questions from exam point of view, starting from question number 116 to question number 130. For those who are new to this channel, I want to say that we have already covered 115 questions spanning across 8 parts. If you miss watching any of those parts, make sure to watch them all before you give your AZ900 exam because each question in these part will elevate your scores in AZ900 certification. The links for all of these parts are now appearing in the i button on the top right corner and also available in the description box below. To all my viewers, once again, thank you so much for all the love that you have given to this channel. I request you to hit that like button so that YouTube algorithm can send these videos to a larger number of audience. For those who are new to this channel, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Let's begin our part 9 with question number 160. The question says that a company ABC uses management groups to manage resources in your Azure tenant more efficiently. They want user alpha to be able to manage user access to Azure resources. You need to determine which role based access control RBAC role user alpha should be added. Your solution should follow the principle of least privilege. To which role should you add user alpha? Should it be user access administrator? Should it be owner or management group contributor? Or should it be just contributor? It's important that you understand the questions very well and what is the exact ask from this user alpha. It's mentioned that user alpha should be able to manage user access to Azure resources. So he just needs to manage resources he does not need to create or do other things with the resources. Thus, we can say the contributor and management group contributor are already ruled out. So the correct answer for this question is user access administrator. Talking about all these roles, this is the Microsoft page where you can get all the details about all these classic subscription administrator roles, Azure roles and Azure AD roles. If you scroll a little on this page, then you will reach to the section which talks about Azure roles. Here you can read that Azure RBAC is an authorization system built in Azure Resource Manager that provides fine-grained access management to Azure groups. As I already mentioned that the contributor, it can create and manage all type of resources. It can also create a new tenant in Azure Active Directory and it but it cannot grant access to the other user. However, our requirement is a user that can manage all the Azure resources. 
and here you can read more on user access administrator the user access administrator it can manage user access to azure resource that's why this is the answer that we have chosen in our question number 160. now you might be wondering that why i have not chosen owner that could also be an answer so the reason being because in the question you can read that user should follow the principle of least privilege it's very important to focus here least privilege so we don't want to give our user more access or more power than it is needed and that's the reason to choose user access administrator moving on with question number 170 the question says that which azure service should you use to store certificates should it be azure security center or azure storage account or should it be azure key vault or azure information protection the correct answer for question number 117 is azure key vault now here i am on the microsoft page that talks more about azure key vaults here you can read on the very first line it says that azure key vault is a cloud service for securely storing and accessing secrets a secret is anything that you want to tightly control access to such as api keys passwords certificates and cryptographic keys i hope you have already noted the word certificate here and that's exactly our question is also asking we need to store certificates so we have chosen azure key vault just to increase your knowledge on other services as well azure security service that's actually set of tools for monitoring and managing security for virtual machines and other cloud computing resources within microsoft azure cloud coming to the azure storage account storage account contains azure storage objects including blobs files shares queues tables and disks and etc so this is what azure storage account is meant for then coming to the azure information protection this one is a cloud-based solution that enables organizations to discover classify protect documents or email by applying labels to the content so I hope you got a fair idea about all the other services as well, besides the answer that we chose. Coming to the question number 180, this one is asking which service provides serverless computing in Azure? Is it Azure Virtual Machine, Azure Functions, Azure Storage Account or Azure Container Service? I'm really sure all of those who have covered all the eight earlier parts can answer this question very easily. The correct answer for this question is Azure Functions. If you want to learn more about Azure Functions, then this is the Microsoft page where you can find all the details. However, just to read the first line, it says that Azure Functions is a serverless solution that allows you to write less code, maintain less infrastructure and save cost. You already noted that this is a serverless solution. Coming to the question number 119. This question says an Azure service is available to the customers when it is in, is it private preview, public preview, development or enterprise agreement EA subscription. So when exactly any Azure service is available for customers. So the correct answer for this one is public preview. Only once the service has come to the public preview, it will be available for customers like you and me to use it to all my viewers if you want a pdf version of the ppt that i'm using in part 9 then you have to tell me the answers for the following questions you have to give me the answers for question number 119 question number 123 and question number 130 in the comment section below all of you who will give correct answers for all three questions will get a pdf version of part 9 ppt Coming to our question number 120. This one is a yes no type of question. Let's read the first statement. It says that data is stored in Azure storage account automatically has at least three copies. Now just to tell you more about data replication, there are actually a lot of options available in Azure for data replication such as LRS, ZRS, GRS or GARS and probably many more. 
LRS is the minimum of them and it's also known as locally redundant storage and the data is replicated in this one synchronously three times within the primary region. So that's why this statement is yes. Moving on with the second statement, we have all data that is copied to an Azure storage account is backed up automatically to another Azure data center. The correct answer for this one is no, that's not true because it's not automatically set. However, if you want, you can manually configure it. But in this question, it asks and stress upon automatically. Thus, the correct answer is no. Now coming to the third statement, which says an Azure storage account can contain up to 2 TB of data and up to 1 million files. The correct answer for this one is no, that's not correct. The limits as I'm recording this video is much higher than this one. If you want to drill down more into Azure storage account, then this is the Microsoft page that you can read upon. All the links that I'm showing you in this video will be shared in the description box below. Then quickly jumping to question number 121. This is again, yes, no kind of question. Reading out the first statement we have, if you have Azure resources deployed to every region, you can implement availability zone in all regions. The correct answer for this one is no. It's not true that all Azure region support availability zones. So there are some regions that do not support availability zones. However, they are very less, but yes, there are. So that's why the reason for choosing a no. Then we have second statement, which says only virtual machines that run Windows servers can be created in availability zone. Of course, by now you know that this answer is no. We also have support for Linux machines as well. Then we have third statement which says availability zones are used to replicate data and applications to multiple region. Once again, reiterating that availability zones, as the name also suggests, are there to build high availability for your applications. They are not used to replicate data. Thus, the correct answer for this one is no. Now coming to question number 122. This one says that you plan to deploy a critical line of business application to Azure. The application will run on Azure virtual machine. You need to recommend a deployment solution for the application. The solution must provide a guaranteed availability of 99.99%. What is the minimum number of virtual machines and minimum number of availability zones you should recommend for the deployment? To answer, select appropriate option in the answer area. To simplify the question, the question is just asking you that how many virtual machines and how many availability zones should you deploy if you want to achieve an availability of 99.99%. The correct answer for this one is you need to have at least two virtual machines and you need to have at least two availability zones. If you are interested to know more about regions and availability zones, then this is a good page to start with. Now coming to our question number 123. This one says that your company hosts an accounting application named App1 that is used by all the customers of the company. App1 has low usage during the first three weeks of each month and very high usage during the last week of the month. Which benefit of Azure Cloud Service supports cost management for this type of usage pattern? Now, as you read through the questions, you can already understand that for the first three weeks, we have a very high usage of the app one. However, when it comes to the last week, then the usage is a low. So I hope you have noted that sometimes the usage can go up while the other times it can come down. So you need to tell one cloud service that can support this kind of scaling up and scaling down. So the correct answer for this question is elasticity. We have talked about elasticity in our previous videos as well. But for those who are new here, I can just tell that elasticity is the ability to quickly expand or decrease computer processing, memory and storage to meet changing demands. And that's why elasticity is the correct option. 
Coming to question number 124. This one says, you need to identify which blades in Azure portal must be used to perform following task. View security recommendations, monitor the health of Azure services, browse available virtual machines images. So this is the answer area and you can see there are three sections and you have to select options from each of these drop down menus so that you can perform these tasks. So let's come to the first part. So the first task is view security recommendation. Should you go to the monitor blade or subscription or marketplace or advisor blade so that you can view security recommendation. The correct answer for this one is advisor. Moving on with the second task, it's given that you want to monitor health of Azure services. So what should you select? The correct answer is monitor. Of course, you have to select monitor blade if you want to monitor the health of Azure services. Then the third task is that you want to browse all the virtual machines images. So which Azure blade should you go where you can browse all the virtual machine images? The correct answer for this one is marketplace. Just to give you an analogy of marketplace, it is something like app store in Apple phones or Google play store in Android. So where you can go and browse and download or work with the different uh, applications. And in case of Azure marketplace, you can go there and browse available virtual machine images. Now here is our question number 125. A yes, no kind of question. Let's read the first statement. The first statement says that Azure monitor can monitor the performance of on-premise computers. Now here I am on the Microsoft documentation for Azure monitor. This one says that Azure monitor helps you maximize the availability and performance of your application and services. It delivers a comprehensive solution for collecting, analyzing, acting on telemetry from your cloud and on premise environment. So I hope you got your answer that yes, Azure monitor can be used for on premise environment as well. Thus, the correct answer for this one is yes. Moving on with the second statement, this says Azure monitor can send alerts to Azure Active Directory security group. The correct answer for this is no, because Azure monitor, though it can be used to create alerts, but it cannot send alerts to Azure Active Directory security groups. Moving on with the third statement, this one is Azure monitor can trigger alerts based on data in Azure log analytics workspace. The correct answer for this one is yes. Yes, Azure monitor can trigger alerts based on data in Azure Log Analytics workspace. Now quickly moving to our question number 126. In this one, it's given that you need to manage Azure by using Azure Cloud Shell. Which portal icon should you select? To answer, select appropriate icon in the answer area. Now you are given a screenshot from the Azure portal and there are a lot of icons given here. And out of these icons, you have to tell clicking on which you can activate Azure Cloud Shell. The correct answer for this question is this icon here. You can see this small icon that looks like a prompt. If you click this icon in the Azure portal, this will activate Azure Cloud Shell. Here I am on the cloud portal. Now you can see this icon here. This was the different icons that were given in the question as well. Now if I will just zoom a little, then you can see this prompt. If you click on this, now you can see that terminal window is getting activated and this is where you run your cloud shell. So you, now you can see that it's connecting to the terminal and there are two types of scripts that you can use. One is PowerShell and the other one is bash. So once it gets connected, then you will receive a prompt like this. And here you can run your Azure Cloud Shell in PowerShell or in Bash mode. So I hope now you understand which icon to click when you want to work with Azure Cloud Shell. Coming to question number 127 of our part 9. So question number 27 gives you some statements that are related to Azure DevOps and you have to tell yes and no for them. 
So let's read out the first statement. The first statement says that Azure DevOps services allow developers to deploy or update applications to Azure using continuous integration, continuous delivery, CI-CD pipelines. The correct answer for this statement is yes. Yes, of course, you can use Azure DevOps services for CI-CD pipeline. Now here I am on the Microsoft page that gives a lot of details about Azure DevOps. So if you will scroll down a little on this page, then you can see that pipelines are used for CI CD on any platform. And that's exactly why we have chosen yes here. Moving on with the second statement, this one says that Azure DevOps services includes a Git repository for developers to store code. The correct answer for this one is yes, of course. Coming on to the same page of Azure DevOps and in this we have the section which talks about Azure repos. Using Azure repos, you get unlimited cloud hosted private Git repos and collaborate to build better code with pull request and advanced file management. And that's why we have chosen yes here. Moving on with the third statement, we have Azure DevOps service can be used to build and host web apps. We have just seen that Azure DevOps is a service that is used to build CI CD pipeline. It also helps you to have a Git repository. However, it has nothing to do with building a web app. So the correct answer for this statement is no. Coming to question number 128. This one is a drag and drop kind of question. So here you are given some of the definitions on the right hand side corner. And on the left hand side, you are given with some of the Azure services that you have to match off with these definitions. So let's read out the first definition. The first definition says an integrated solution for the deployment of code. We just saw in question number 127, the service for integrated solution for deployment of code is Azure DevOps. So this is the correct answer for this statement. Then moving on with our second definition. This one says a tool that provides guidance and recommendations to improve an Azure environment. The correct answer for this one is Azure Advisor. Moving on with the third statement, we have a simplified tool to build artificial intelligence applications. The correct Azure service that helps us build AI application is Azure Cognitive Services. Moving on with the fourth statement, this one says monitors web application. The correct answer for this one is Azure Application Insights. Moving on with question number 129. But before that, friends, sometimes you might notice that there are repeat in questions. Please understand that this is done for a purpose as repetition will engrave the answers in your mind and you will be easily able to recall them while you are giving the exam. With that, now let's read the question number 129. It says you plan to implement an Azure database solution. You need to implement a database solution that meet following requirements. Can add data concurrently from multiple regions and can store JSON documents. Which database service should you deploy? Now here you can see that Microsoft has given almost all the database connected services to confuse you a lot. But Concentrate on the keywords so that you can find the answer easily. Now here the keywords are that you can add data concurrently from multiple regions. That's the important keyword that multiple regions are needed. The other hint Microsoft gives you that you should be able to store JSON document. With those two hints, you can easily identify the answer. The correct answer for this question is Azure Cosmos DB. Just to tell you a little bit more about Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB is a globally distributed multi-model database service. Also Cosmos DB is a great way to store unstructured data such as JSON files. So that's why we have chosen Cosmos DB as an answer. Friends, sometimes these questions will get really tricky. As you saw in this question, a lot of services are given which can confuse you because all of them are somehow related to the database only. 
please try to catch important keywords from the question and then using those try to answer. If you want to read more about Azure Cosmos DB, then this is the Microsoft documentation page where you can come and start your journey with Azure Cosmos DB. The links as always will be provided in the description box. Okay, with that, let's move to question number 130. This will be the last question for our part nine of our AZ 900 real exam question and answer series. Reading it out, it says you have an Azure environment that contains multiple Azure virtual machines. You plan to implement a solution that enables the client computers on your on-premise network to communicate to Azure virtual machine. You need to recommend which Azure resource must be created for planned solution. Which two Azure resource should you include in the recommendation? Each correct answer presents part of the solution. Here you have to keep in mind that you have to choose two Azure resource. If you only choose one, then a mark will be deducted from your score. The correct answer for this question is option A, a virtual network gateway and option E, a gateway subnet. Now here is the Microsoft page that talks about connect an on-premise network to Microsoft Azure virtual network. And this is the exact requirement that we also have in our question. So it's a long page. You can read more on this page and understand the reasoning behind the answers that I chose. I hope you liked another set of the latest questions from Microsoft AZ 900, which we covered in this part nine. I will see you in the next part. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. Today is our part 10 of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. Today we are going to cover 10 very important questions for AZ900 exam starting from question number 131 to question number 140. If you are new to this channel or have missed any part in this series, I just need to tell you that we have already covered 130 questions in earlier 9 parts. Each question is carefully picked for exam point of view. Friends, this channel is not only to give you just question and answer pool, but my main focus is that by the time you have certificate in your hand, you should also have a workable understanding on Azure Cloud. And that's the reason I share proper Microsoft documentation, detailed justification and explained each concept so you understand why a certain answer is correct. Important links are also shared in each video. Tips and tricks are also there in some of the parts. So don't miss any of these parts before you appear for the AZ900 certification exam. And I'm sure that you will score very high in the certification. So let's begin our part 10 with question number 131. The question says that recommend a tool to automatically send an alert if an administrator stops an Azure virtual machine. Your options are Azure Logic Apps, Azure Machine Learning Designer, Azure Monitor or Azure Advisor. The correct answer for this question is Azure Monitor. If you want to learn more about Azure Monitor, then this is a good page to start with. On this page, you will find overview on Azure Monitor. You will just scroll down. There is a video, a nice one, where you can understand. However, they have explained this diagram below as well. If you will come a little down here in this overview section, you can see this diagram, which beautifully explains how you can use Azure Monitor. So over on the left hand side, you can see various sources from where you can collect metrics or logs from like application operating system azure resources subscription or azure tenant and then you also have a ability to bring in your custom sources as well then once you have collected these logs or metrics you can push these logs to other functions that will ingest these logs and matrices 
to build out more business specific insights. So for example, you can put this log or push these logs to insights. Then you can visualize these logs using applications like Power BI. Then you can analyze these logs or respond. If you want to build an alert mechanism based on some logs or metrics, then you can also build the same. Then you can also integrate the logs with logic apps or export APIs. So it's an interesting page to learn the Azure Monitor, which I say is a very important service from Azure because these days all the applications and services generate a lot of logs, valuable insights are hidden in those logs. So a great service to explore. Now, before I jump into the question number 132, I just want to give you an overview of other services as well, because you never know what question can come in your Microsoft AZ-900 exam. So at least you should have an overview of other services at back of your mind. So let's begin with Azure Logic App. Logic App is a cloud-based platform for creating and running automatic workflows that integrate your app data service and system it's a very interesting service from microsoft i have been using logic apps in my applications and it gives a versatile capability to build automated uh, workflows so go and check out i will provide some links where you can explore more on logic apps moving on with azure machine learning designer this is uh, this actually gives you a drag and drop interface that, that you can use to train or deploy model in Azure Machine Learning. Coming to the Azure Advisor. So Azure Advisor is a kind of a recommendation service that analyzes your configuration and usage and then it helps you to follow best Microsoft Azure practices. So great service to look for. If you want to learn more on Azure Advisor, then on this Azure portal, you can come down here. You see here, it's a Azure Advisor. Here you can click on, otherwise, when you have some recommendations from Microsoft, you can also see the pop-up coming on your bell icon. So if you will click that bell icon, you can see it says that successfully refresh recommendations for Azure Advisor. So if you want to explore what are the recommendations that were given, you can come down here on the advisor section. And here you can see there will be a lot of advices that Microsoft gives you based on your configuration or usage pattern. And it gives you recommendation on cost, security, reliability, and many more. So I would say whenever you are using Azure, this is the space that you want to come very often so that you can learn and gain insights on Microsoft best practices. Now moving on to the question number 132. The question says that Azure billing is attached on what level? Is it attached on resource group level or is it on Azure Active Directory level or is it on Azure subscription level? To answer this question, let me again take you to the Azure portal. Now, if you come to the Azure portal, let me just switch to the home page once again. And here you can see the subscription. However, if you don't find it here, then you can always come down to this left hand side blade and you have to come down to the subscription. If you click subscription, then here you can see the name of my subscription, my subscription ID, the role I have in my Azure portal. And then you can also see the current cost. So this is my current cost because I am in Sweden. That's why the cost is shown in Swedish Krona, which is a Swedish currency. So you can see this is my current cost. And as you can already notice that the cost is always associated or your billing is always associated to the subscription. And that's exactly the answer of this question. So always remember that Azure billing is attached to subscription. Moving on with question number 133. This one says a common platform for deploying objects to a cloud infrastructure and for implementing consistency across the Azure environment. Is it Azure policies or is it resource group or Azure resource manager template or is it management group? The correct answer for this question is Azure resource manager templates or popularly known as ARM template. You can read more about ARM template on this page. Here you can see 
that to implement infrastructure as a code for Azure solution, use Azure Manager template or as I said, ARM template. The template is a JavaScript object notation or JSON file that defines the infrastructure and configuration for your project. Further down on this page, you can also read why to choose ARM template. So it talks about declarative syntax. What is the syntax of ARM template? Then you can expect always repetitable results when you are using ARM templates. So few of the reasoning why you should choose ARM template for your deployments. Besides that, just to give you a glimpse of Azure policy, Azure policy actually helps you to enforce the standards or access the compliance at a scale. So this uh, option or Azure policy is more related to compliance thing. So it's not related to deploying objects. So coming to the resource group, resource group provides you ability where you can manage related resources in Azure uh, in a more efficient way. The management group on the other hand is, let's say your organization has multiple uh, subscriptions. So now you need some mechanism to efficiently handle that uh, those subscription. So that's where management groups come into picture. So it gives you a mechanism to handle multiple subscription if you have. Moving on with question number 134. This one says that you have an Azure environment. You need to create a new virtual machine from a tablet that runs on Android operating system. What are three possible solutions? Each correct answer presents a complete solution. So your options are use Bash in Azure Cloud Shell, use PowerShell in Azure Cloud Shell, use Power Apps, CMD Prompt or use Azure Portal. Now I have talked a lot about Azure Cloud Shell in my previous videos as well. But of course, for the betterment of people who have just joined us on this channel, let me show you a quick glimpse of Azure Cloud Shell. So here, if you see this icon, which looks like a prompt, if you click on this, then you can see a terminal window opening up. It's connecting or requesting a Cloud Shell. Now here, you can see that it's starting to begin with a Cloud Shell. Then there will be an authentication. And after that, the authentication, once done, then you get a prompt where you can use PowerShell or Bash. So just to show you, you have two options here, PowerShell and Bash. The important thing to notice here is that we are in Azure portal. So that is one thing. We are running Azure portal on a browser, a Chrome browser. Then we have two options, PowerShell and Bash to run within the Azure portal. Now with that quick demo, which I just showed you on the Azure portal, it's easy to identify the correct options. The correct options are use Bash in Azure Cloud Shell or use PowerShell in Azure Cloud Shell. And of course, we are running both Bash and PowerShell from the Azure portal. So these are the three correct options. Coming to our question number 135. This is a yes, no kind of question. So let's read the first statement. The first statement says that from Azure Service Health, an administrator can view the health of all the services in Azure environment. The correct answer is yes. Azure Service Health provides a personalized view of the health of the Azure services and regions that you are using. So this is the best service where you can view the health of all the other services in the Azure environment. Moving on with the second statement we have from Azure Service Health, an administrator can create a rule to be alerted if Azure service fails. The correct answer for this one is yes. Yes, you can use Azure Service Health not only to view the health of the services, but also to create an alert mechanisms if any of your service fails. Then we have the third statement which says from Azure Service Health, an administrator can prevent a service failure. The correct answer for this one is no. As I just mentioned that you can use Azure Service Health to view the health of the services. You can additionally also create the rules if any service fail. However, by no means Azure Service Health can prevent any service failure. That's why the answer is no. 
Then moving on with our question number 136. Again, a yes, no kind of question. This one says that Azure Advisor can generate a list of Azure virtual machines that are not backed up. The correct answer for this is yes. You can surely use Azure Advisor to generate a list of virtual machines that are not backed up. Then we have second statement that says that if you implement the security recommendations provided by Azure Advisor, your company secure score will increase. The correct answer is yes. I mentioned this in the question number 131 as well, where I gave you a quick demo of Azure Advisor. And there I showed you that Azure Advisor provides you recommendations on various level. So you have recommendations on cost, security, performance and many more. So if you implement those recommendations, definitely your company's secure score will increase. Moving on with the third statement we have to maintain Microsoft support, you must implement security recommendations provided by Azure Advisor within a period of 30 days. The correct answer is no. If you read the statement very carefully, this one says that these are security recommendations. So recommendations are optional thing. It's very good that you, if you can implement those recommendations. So recommendations are great in terms of bringing down the cost or improving performance or security of your Azure application. However, they are still recommendations. They are not mandate from Microsoft Azure that you have to implement recommendations. So that's why the answer is no. Coming to question number 137. This says that your company plans to deploy an artificial intelligence or AI solution in Azure. What should the company use to train and deploy models in Azure machine learning? So your options are Azure Logic Apps or Azure Machine Learning Designer, Azure Batch or Azure Cosmos DB. Let's go to the Microsoft documentation to find out the correct answer. Now I am on a Microsoft documentation that talks more about Azure Machine Learning Designer. So if you will read the very first line, it says that Azure Machine Learning Designer is a drag and drop interface that is used to train and deploy models in Azure Machine Learning. And that's the exact what our question is also asking for. Thus, the correct answer for this question is Azure Machine Learning Designer. Coming to question number 138, it says that you have an Azure web app. You need to manage the settings of web app from an iPhone. What tool you can use? So you are given with many options like Linux, Azure Portal, Windows PowerShell and Azure Storage Explorer. Before we find out the answer, let me tell you that this question is also a variation of question number 134 that we just saw in the previous slides. And these variations are quite important. That's why I build in all the variations of the same questions, the different ways the Microsoft can put that question to you so that you are very well prepared for the certification. And in question number 134 also, I showed you how you can use Azure PowerShell or Azure Bash from Azure Portal. So the correct answer for this question is also Azure Portal because you can run Azure Portal from any browser and here we have an iPhone and you can very well run a browser in iPhone and using that browser you can open Azure Portal and from that portal you can run Azure Cloud Shell with two variations either you can use PowerShell or you can use a Bash. So that's why we have chosen Azure Portal. Moving on with the next question, we have question number 139. This one is a drag and drop kind of question. So here on the left hand side, you are given some of the keywords and you have to match these keywords with the definitions given on the right hand side. So let's read the first definition. It says that analyze security log files from Azure virtual machines. So what do you think is the correct option? Do you think it's Azure Active Directory or Key Vault? Azure Lighthouse, Azure Security Center or Azure Senital. The correct answer for this one is Azure Senital. Moving on with the second statement we have display the secure score for an Azure subscription. The correct answer for this is Azure Security Center. Then we have store password for use by Azure function application. The correct answer for this is Azure Key Vault. 
just an additive that not only you can use Azure Key Vault to store passwords for Azure Functions, you can use Azure Key Vault to store password for pretty much any service. You can also store certificates in Azure Key Vault. So a very good service by Microsoft to keep your credentials, passwords, important certificates in a very safe repository. Coming to question number 140, which is the last question for our part 10 of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. This one again is a drag and drop kind of question and you are presented with some of the keywords here or Microsoft services and on the right hand side you are given with some definitions. So you have to match these definitions with these Microsoft Azure services. The first definition says a managed relational cloud database service. The correct answer for this definition is Azure SQL database. Then the second definition says a cloud-based service that leverages on massively parallel processing MPP to quickly run complex queries across petabytes of data in relational database. The correct answer for this definition is Azure SQL CNAPS Analytics. Just a quick tip from my side, whenever in the question you see massively parallel processing MPP and it also talks about petabytes of data or you can say big amount of data, then you can always safely go for Azure SQL CNAP Analytics. Moving on with the third definition, it says can run massively parallel data transformation and processing program across petabyte of data. The correct answer for this definition is Azure Data Lake Analytics. Coming to the fourth definition, we have an open source framework for distributed processing and analysis of big data set in clusters. The correct answer for this is Azure HD Insight. I hope you enjoyed part 10 containing 10 very important questions as much as I did presenting to you. Also friends, remember that we have already covered 140 questions and this series will contain one more part, part 11, that will also contain a set of 10 more questions. Once again to mention, besides this 11 parts, I will also take a bonus part where I will take all of your questions and answer them in that bonus part. So be ready and put all your questions and doubts in the comment section so that I can compile every questions and bring up the answers to them in the bonus part. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. This is our part 11 of our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. And friends, this is our last part for our AZ900 question and answer series. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you all for giving me so much of love and giving such attention to this series. And congratulations to all who have passed AZ900 with great marks and best of luck to all who want to attempt in future. As promised, besides these 11 parts, I will also bring a bonus part where I will answer all of your questions on AZ900. So use the comment section below and send me all your questions or doubts. And don't miss to give me a like and press that subscribe button. More and more exam series are already planned and you don't want to miss any of those. Friends, this series has been quite happening and in total, we have covered 150 questions spread across 11 parts. Each question is supported by proper explanation and documentation proof from Microsoft. The entire series will surely help you to get high scores in the AZ900 certification. And not only that, you will also be geared up to work in Azure by the time you get your certification. So don't miss any of the 11 part before you appear for the examination. The link for the entire playlist is given below in the description box and also appearing in the i button on the top right corner. So let's begin our part 11 with question number 141. The question says that which tool enables users to authenticate 
to multiple application by single sign on or also known as SSO. Your options are Azure Resource Group, Azure Active Directory, Azure Advisor or Azure Monitor. The correct answer for this question is Azure Active Directory. Now let's check out the Microsoft documentation to understand why this is the correct answer. Now here I am on the Microsoft documentation which talks more about Azure Active Directory. The documentation says that Azure Active Directory Enterprise Entity Service provides single sign-on, multi-factor authentication and conditional access to guard against 99.9% .9 of cyber security attacks. I'm sure you have already noted the keyword here which is single sign-on. With that proof from Microsoft documentation, we can be sure that our answer is correct. Before I jump into the question number 142, I want to give you some more details on Azure Resource Group, Azure Advisor and Azure Monitor. These topics are very important from the exam point of view. So you should have at least some basic understanding on all of these. You can expect quite some questions from all these three areas as well. So let's first understand Azure Resource Group. Azure Resource Group is a container that holds related resources for an Azure solution. The resource group can also include resources for your entire organizational solution. But I would say the better way is to group related resources and manage them as a group inside a single resource group. For example, you can combine all the resources related to HR group or HR department in one resource group and all the resources related to finance department in another resource group. Not only the resource group is the better way to handle related resources together, but I would say it is also a better way to delete the resources together. So for example, if you have some related resources to the finance department and you want to delete them, and all of those resources are present in one single resource group, then you don't have to delete them one by one. You just select the resource group and delete them all in one shot. Now from the exam point of view, here are two more important points related to resource group that you must keep in mind because I have seen questions coming based on these two points. The first one is that all the resources in Azure must reside under a resource group. What it means is that you cannot have a resource that does not reside under any resource group. So whenever there is a resource, it has to be under a resource group. Moving on with the second statement, we have one Azure resource can only be inside one resource group. You can move resources from one resource group to another, but the resource cannot be in two resource group at the same time. There might be some questions in AZ-900 exam where they would ask you, can a resource be present in multiple resource group at the same time? And then you know the answer that it is not possible. Now let's briefly understand what is an Azure Advisor. So this is the page where you can read more about Azure Advisor. I would read the first part of it. The Azure Advisor analyzes your configuration and usage telemetry and offers personalized actionable recommendation to help you optimize your Azure resources for reliability, security, operational excellence, performance, and cost. So come on to this page and take a deep dive on Azure Advisor because there are few questions based on Azure Advisor in AZ-900 examination. Moving on, let's understand what is a Azure Monitor. So a Azure Monitor, it helps you maximize the availability and performance of your application and services. It delivers a comprehensive solution for collecting, analyzing, and acting on telemetry from your on-premise and cloud environment. I have given a greater detail on Azure Monitor in question number 131 in part 10. You can refer that part for more details on Azure Monitor. With that, now let's move to the question number 142. This question is about Azure Sentinel, and it says that Azure Sentinel use playbook to monitor the Azure services, maintain security certificate, run PowerShell scripts, or automatically respond to threat. Before directly jumping to the answer, let me tell you more about Azure Sentinel because this is one of the lesser known Azure service. And there can be no better way to learn than Microsoft Azure document itself. 
So this is the page that talks more about Microsoft Sentinel. And one important point that you should keep in mind that Azure Sentinel is now called Microsoft Sentinel. So in case you have gotten a question with Microsoft Sentinel or you get a question on Azure Sentinel, you should be sure that they are both talking about same thing. So let's understand what a Microsoft Sentinel is. So Microsoft Sentinel is a scalable cloud native security information and event management and security orchestration, automation and response solution. And here, if you scroll a little down, you can see there are steps that are given in context to the Microsoft Sentinel. And this picture helps you understand all these steps in a better way. So Microsoft Sentinel starts with collecting security data across your enterprise. So once it has collected the data, then it moves towards the detection of threats. Once the detection is also done, then it tries to investigate what are the threats with its critical incidents guided by AI technology. And once the investigation is done, then it moves towards the response. So it responds to the threats automatically. And while I'm reading this, I also note that Microsoft has still not changed. It still calls it Azure Sentinel while on the page above that Azure Sentinel is now called Microsoft Sentinel. So keep in mind that Microsoft Sentinel is something that can collect data around security. It can detect your threats, then it investigates the threat and then it respond to the threats. Besides this page, there is one more interesting page on Microsoft Sentinel and this is this one which gives you more details on using the playbook with automation rules in Microsoft Sentinel. Now coming back to the PPT, I hope you can already answer the question. The correct answer for this question is automatically respond to the threats. And that's the exact purpose of Azure Sentinel. In fact, should I also say it now Microsoft Sentinel. Now let's move to the question number 143. This question is about Azure total cost ownership. It says that who can use Azure total cost of ownership TCO calculator. So let's start by understanding what is a Azure total cost ownership calculator. So this is a calculator that helps you estimate the cost of operating your solution on Azure over time instead of running that solution on premise. So let's say the company wants to move the application from on premise data center to cloud. Now the very first question that comes to everyone is how much it costs to run the same application on cloud. Is there any way that you can already make an estimate before you even move to the cloud? And here exactly where Azure total cost of ownership comes into picture. So it enables you to estimate the cost of moving your entire solution from on-premise data center to Azure cloud. This is the page where you can read more about Azure total cost of ownership calculator. It's a great page that gives you a lot of insights about how Azure uh, total cost of ownership calculator works. And here, if you press this button here, it says start assessment. If you click on this, then you can see it loads all the details, all the nitty gritties that probably might be used in your current data center solution. And you can see it gives you some sections which are servers. So you could be using servers in your existing solution or data center. You could have database, you could have storage, networking. So each component that possibly might be already in your data center solution is present here. Now, if you expand each section, then here you can try to estimate what would be the cost of servers being moved from data center to Azure Cloud. Similarly, you can estimate the cost of database, storage and networking as well. So I hope you understood that Azure Total Cost of Ownership Calculator is primarily used by the people who are still to move to Azure Cloud. They are already not present in Azure Cloud. They want to go there. So the correct answer for this question is anyone. Now let's jump to the question number 144. The question says that you have an on-premises application that sends email notifications automatically based on a rule. You plan to migrate the application to Azure. You need to recommend a serverless computing solution for the application. What should you include in the recommendation? Your options are web app, server image in Azure Marketplace, Logic App or an API app. Correct answer for this question is Logic App. 
just to give you a clue why I choose logic app the, the reason is whenever there is keywords like serverless computing in your question then two services you should always keep in mind first one is logic app and the second one is Azure function so always try to relate serverless computing with these two Azure services now let's jump to the question number 145 the question says that you plan to deploy a website to Azure. The website will be accessed by users worldwide and will host large video files. You need to recommend which Azure feature must be used to provide best video playback experience. What should you recommend? Should you recommend an application gateway or an Azure Express route circuit, a CDN network, or should you recommend Azure Traffic Manager? Now here on this page from Microsoft, more details on CDN network are given. So a content delivery network or better known as CDN is a distributed network of servers that can efficiently deliver web contents to users. CDNs store cached content on edge servers in point to presence POP location that are close to end users to minimize latency. So have you noticed the keywords here? The keywords here are can efficiently deliver web content to the users. And that's exactly what our question wants us to do. So it wants us to provide the best video playback experience. Thus, the correct answer for this question is option number C, a content delivery network or CDN. Now let's talk about all the other services so that you are not left behind if the questions are coming from these areas. So the Azure Application Gateway is a web traffic load balancer that enables you to manage traffic to your web application. On the other hand, Azure Express Route Circuit represents a logical connection between your on-premises infrastructure and Microsoft Cloud Service through a connectivity provider. You can order multiple Express Route Circuits. Moving on with the Azure Traffic Manager, it's a DNS based traffic load balancer. So this service allows you to distribute traffic to your public facing application across the globe in Azure region. Traffic Manager also provides you with public endpoints with high availability and quick responsiveness. So I hope you got a gist of other services as well in this question. Now let's move to our question number 146. Now this question talks about SLA or service level agreement. So let's read out. It says that you have an application that is comprised of an Azure web app that has a service level agreement of 99.95% and an Azure SQL database that has an SLA of 99.99. The composite SLA of the application is the product of both SLAs which equals to 99.94%. Now let's read the instructions. The instruction says that review the underlying text. So this is the underlying text here. You can see if it makes statement correct, then select no change needed. If the statement is incorrect, then you have to select the answer amongst these options given below. So let me just briefly tell you more about composite SLA. So guys, whenever you are designing a Azure solution, you must be using different services. For example, you might be using Azure Virtual Machines, Database, or maybe a web app. And every service in Azure has a associated SLA attached with it. But how will you calculate a composite SLA? Which means that you have different services. Every service has a different SLA. But what about the composite SLA of the solution in total? How to calculate that? And let me just give you a small demonstration on our calculator so that you can understand how these composite SLAs are calculated. So now let's multiply both of these numbers. We have 99.95 and then we have 99.99 and this gives us 9994.0005. Now, as I said, you have to divide it by 100 and this gives you 99.94. Now, do not get confused with this comma because I'm in part of Europe. 
where decimal is also represented as comma. So you can read it as 99.94. So I hope this small demonstration made you understand the calculation of composite SLA in an easier way. However, those who want to deep dive can come to this page and read more. If you will scroll down a little, they have also given an example on how to calculate the composite SLA. So here you can see the same example is given here, a web app service that has 99.95 and a SQL database 99.99% percentage of SLA. And now what they're essentially doing is, is a multiplication of both the SLA to reach the final composite SLA. And as always friends, all the links that I'm using in this video will be given in the description box below. Now coming to the PPT, the correct answer is no change needed because as we calculated, the composite SLA for both the services will come to the 99.94%. Now let's jump to the question number 147 and it's a yes no kind of question. Now let's deal with the first statement. The first statement says that the cost of Azure resource can vary between regions. The correct answer for this statement is yes. See, it's very important for you to understand that in Azure, you can deploy resources in various regions. Now to give you an example, let's say that you have deployed a virtual machine in East US and the other one have you deployed in Japan, let's say for example. Now do you think the cost of both the virtual machines given the fact that all other configurations are same will be equal? The answer is no, because the cost of resources in different regions can differ significantly. So for example, the difference between East US 2 and Japan East region is about 58% for specific virtual machine sizes. Now keep in mind guys, the figures or the percentage that I'm giving, they can definitely change. So to get the correct picture of that, always refer to the Microsoft documentation. However, the idea I wanted to give you is that the cost of same service can vary from location to location. Moving on with the second statement, this says that an Azure reservation is used to reserve server capacity at a specific data center. The correct answer for this is no. To justify why I have chosen a no here, let's read the statement once again. The statement says that an Azure reservation is used to reserve server capacity at specific data center level. So it's important that you are noting that the question or the statement is asking whether reservation can be done on a specific data center level or not. And what could be the better way to understand this than doing it in practical on Azure portal itself. So let's go to the Azure portal. So here I am on the Azure reservation page and from here you can purchase reservation for quite a different kind of Azure services. You can see we have virtual machines, SQL servers, we also have managed decks and a lot of other services that you can make reservation for. So let me choose one of the services. Let's go for the first one, which is virtual machine. If I click on this one, now you can see that select the product you want to purchase. If you come a little down here and you see this section here, it gives you some heading. For example, name, name is the kind of virtual machine that you want to make reservation for. Then you have region, then you have instance flexibility group and a lot of other information. Now, I hope that you remember that the statement was asking that the Azure reservation can be done on data center level. But if you see the headings here, you can see that the scope of the reservation is not on the data center level, but the scope is on region level. So you cannot make reservation of any Azure service on data center level. So always keep that small tip in mind. So I hope that small hands-on on Azure portal has helped you understand why I have chosen a no for this statement. Let me tell you more about Azure reservation. So Azure reservation helps you save money by committing a one year or three year plan for multiple products. Now committing always help you to get a discount on the resources that you are using. So reservation can significantly reduce your resource cost by up to 72% from pay as you go prices. So, so reservations provide a billing discount and do not affect the runtime state of your resource. After you purchase a reservation, 
the discount automatically applies to the matching resource. I hope you got a fair idea about what Azure reservation is used for. Now coming to the third statement, this one says that you can stop an Azure SQL database instance to decrease the cost. Now we have talked a lot about Azure SQL database throughout this 11 parts and there have been many questions around Azure SQL database. But once again, I just want to tell you that Azure database is a fully managed platform as a service. Always keep that in mind platform as a service. And it's a database engine that handles most of the database management function such as upgrading, patching, uh, backups and monitoring without user involvement. Now SQL database does not provide access to the underlying SQL server and hence it does not allow you to stop Azure SQL database. And that's why the correct answer for this statement is no. Before moving ahead, I just wanted to say that friends, if you're liking my efforts that goes in finding proper Microsoft documentation to justify each answer and giving you explanation for each question, then do encourage me by liking the videos and subscribing to the channel. Your each like will ensure that the videos are reaching to the greater audience. Your comments and feedbacks are very valuable for me and I make sure to read each one of them and answer them as well. Keep supporting me and I shall bring the very best of the content. Now let's move on to question number 148. This is a drag and drop kind of question and here on the left hand side you are given with some of the Azure services and you have to match these services to the definitions given on right hand side. Now let's read the first definition. It says provides the platform for serverless code. Now you have to choose which of these services will match with this definition. So the correct answer for this one is Azure Functions. Now I have mentioned this a couple of times that guys whenever you are seeing the word serverless code then two Azure services should always strike your mind. The first one is of course Azure Function and the second one is Azure Logic App. Moving on with the second statement we have a big data analysis service for machine learning. The correct answer for this statement is Azure Databricks. Then in the third statement we have detects and diagnose anomalies in web apps. The correct answer for this one is Azure Application Insights. And then the last one says host web apps. And the correct answer for this one is Azure App Service. Now keep in mind it could be host web apps or it could also be host mobile apps. In both the cases the correct answer should be Azure App Service. Moving on with question number 149. This one is again a drag and drop kind of question. And of course in this one also we have to match the Azure services with the definitions given on the right hand side. So let's read the first definition. It says that ability to use the same credentials to access multiple resources and application. And I'm sure you guessed the correct answer and that is single sign on. So single sign on gives you the ability where you can log in to multiple applications or resources using same credentials. And I'm sure many of you who are already working with some organization have already experienced this. Then moving on with the second statement, we have the process of identifying the access level of a user or service. The correct answer to this one is authorization. Now friends, I have seen many people getting confused between authorization and authentication. So let me give you a very brief difference between both of these. So starting with authentication. Now let's suppose you have a web application. Now whenever you're logging to web application, what you normally do is you provide your user ID and password and then you try to log in. Now when you press the login button, what happens is the internal logic checks whether you are authenticated to log into the application or not. So you can say that authentication is a check whether you are a legitimate person or not. On the other hand, authorization is one step later. So let's say now that you have logged in to the application or the website, that means you are authenticated. Now authorization will decide what can you do on the website. So what is the level of access that you have on the website or any other application? For example, you could have only read only, access or you are an administrator, everything is decided by the authorization process. 
So I hope this quick differentiation between authentication and authorization will really help you answering the questions in AZ-900 certification. Now let's move to the third statement and it says that one or several elements required to identify a user or a service. The correct answer for this one is multi-factor authentication. And friends, multi-factor authentication is not a difficult thing to understand. And I'm sure all of you or at least most of you are already using multi-factor authentication. For example, whenever you're logging to your bank accounts, then what happens? The first level, at the first level, you give your user ID and password. And post that, normally bank sends you a text message or a code on your mobile number or any other application could be used like Google Authenticator or Microsoft Authenticator and many more. So what is this? So you are authenticating a user on multi-level. That's the crux of multi-factor authentication. So not just ID and password, you are enforcing the user to use one more level of authentication so that you can validate the person. That's exactly what multi-factor authentication means. And that brings us to the question number 150, the last question of part 11, as well as the entire series on AZ-900 real exam question and answer series. So now let's read out the question. The question says that you need to view a list of planned maintenance events that can affect the availability of an Azure subscription. Which blade should you use from Azure portal? To answer, select the appropriate blade in the answer area. So friends, first let me show you this in the PPT and then I will take you to the Azure portal to demonstrate in practical. So now let's check out the step-by-step -step process on how to do it. The first step is that on the help and support blade, there is a service help option. Let me show you how. So this is the image of Azure portal and on the left hand side, normally on the Azure portal, you can see all these options. And here on the bottom of the page, you can see an option called help and support. When you click on this help and support, a new window opens that is called help and support and here on this window you can see the option which is called service health and when you click on the service health a new window opens and there you can find an option called planned maintenance and this exactly what our question is asking they want us to view a list of planned maintenance events that can affect the availability of an Azure subscription. Now let me take you to the Azure portal and show you how this is done in practical. Now here I am on the home page of Azure portal and on the left hand side you can see down below we have an option called help and support. If you click on this option then you get this window and here on this window you have to click the option which is called service help. When you click this option then in turn you get a new window in which you can see the option which is called as planned maintenance. So whenever there is a planned maintenance in any of the service in the regions that you are using then that planned maintenance will be reflected out here. However as of now you can see that there is no planned events scheduled. Thus it's empty here but normally if there is then you will see all of them here. So I hope with that demonstration on the Azure web portal, you now know how to see the planned maintenance events that affect availability of your Azure subscription. So friends, once again, a big thanks for being with me throughout this series. If you have been benefited with this series, then do appreciate me by pressing that like button. And don't forget many more exciting exam question and answer series are coming in next few days. So do not forget to subscribe. Till we meet each other in the next video, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. In previous videos, I mentioned that I will be doing a bonus part where I will take all of your questions, doubts, suggestions and feedback. And I got a response more than I expected. And due to that, I have to break this bonus video in two parts due to the time limits. Today in this part 12, we will be covering 16 very important questions and I must say they are your questions. The bonus part is truly a video that is entirely based on your questions and suggestions. It's truly my viewers video. 
a big shout out to all of those who contributed in making this bonus part with their questions and suggestions. My sincere thanks to Pupa Kevin, Sara Fontanella, Davo C, Prem Gaikwad, All in One Box Office, and Krishna Chaitanya Reddy. Thank you, everyone. For those who are new here today, it's worth mentioning that a total of 150 questions are already covered in earlier 11 parts. Every question is supported by proper Microsoft documentation to elevate your Azure understanding along with your certification scores. So do not forget to subscribe as new exam series are coming soon and you don't want to miss any of them. The link for the entire AZ900 real exam question and answer series is now appearing in the i button on the top right corner and in the description box below. Friends, you must watch this bonus part very carefully till the very end. Do not skip any part as there are many new tips and tricks throughout this video. Additionally, I have shared new Microsoft documentation and links from the other website that will not only help you getting good marks, but also help you throughout your cloud journey. Before I start, it's very important to understand the numbering convention that I have used in this bonus part. Please make a note that in order to maintain the continuity with our previous parts, I have continued to number the question starting from question number 151. We have already covered 150 questions in our previous parts. As this bonus part is linked to the previous parts in this series and there are some new questions as well based on your suggestion, thus each question has an extra tag that you can see here. So if the question is connected to the previous question in any part, then it will contain a previous question number and it will also contain the part in which it was published. Now, in case the question is entirely new, then it will contain a new tag here. I hope you understood the numbering convention and what all these new tags mean. So let's begin our bonus part. On this slide, I will cover a set of four questions. The idea is to show you variations that can come in AZ900 exam related to the pass or platform as a service offering. You can expect similar questions on IAS or infrastructure as a service or SaaS software as a service. So let's begin our bonus question and answer session part 12 with question number 151. The question says that your company plans to migrate all its data and resources to Azure. The company's migration plan states that only platform as a service solution must be used in Azure. You need to deploy an Azure environment that meets the company's migration plan. What should you create? Should you use Azure Virtual Machines, Azure SQL Database and Azure Storage Account? Or an Azure App Service and Azure Virtual Machine that have Microsoft SQL Server installed? The third option could be an Azure App Service and Azure SQL Database. And the fourth one is Azure Storage Account and Web Server in Azure Virtual Machine. The correct answer for this question is an Azure App Service and Azure SQL Database. Now you might ask why I have not chosen the other three options. The very simple answer to that question is that each of these options A, B and D they have virtual machines in them. So we have virtual machines here in option A, then we have virtual machine here in option B, and we have virtual machine here in option D as well. Now you must keep in mind that virtual machine comes under the category of infrastructure as a service. Whenever you are answering these, these questions, then you have to consider all the options or all the Azure services as one solution. So you have Azure Virtual Machine here, you have Azure SQL Database and you have Azure Storage Account. Now though Azure SQL Database and Azure Storage Account comes into the category of PaaS or Platform as a Service, however, Azure Virtual Machine does not fit in PaaS offering. And that's the reason why I have eliminated the other three options. Now let's look at the other three variations that you can expect in AZ900 exam for the same question. The second variation is given in question number 152. The third variation is given in 153 and the fourth variation is given in 154. 
Now please notice that the question given in all these four variation are exactly the same. However, the solutions given are little different. So for example, in 152, it says that you create an Azure App Service and Azure SQL Database. So does this fit under the category of platform as a service? We just saw in question number 151 that when we are using only Azure App Service and Azure SQL Database, that surely fits under the category of platform as a service. Thus, the answer to question number 152 is yes. Then we have question 153 and in this one, the solution is that you create an Azure App Service, Azure Virtual Machine that has Microsoft SQL Server installed. Whenever there is Azure Virtual Machine given in the question, then it's always infrastructure as a service. So the correct answer for this question is no, it doesn't fit under the category of platform as a service. Now we have question number 154 and in this one again they have given that you create an Azure Virtual Machine and Azure Storage Account. Although Storage Account comes into the category of PaaS, however the Virtual Machine does not fit in PaaS offering. The correct answer for this question is no. Now there was a query from one of our viewers and he mentioned that even if Azure Storage Account comes under the category of PaaS why I have not chosen to answer it as a yes. I already mentioned that whenever answering these questions, you have to take all the Azure services in account and count it as a solution, an overall solution. So in this one, we have two components. We have Azure Virtual Machine and we have Storage Account. Though Storage Account comes under the category of PaaS, but Azure Virtual Machine comes under the category of IAS or Infrastructure as a Service. Thus, the entire solution will not fit under the category of Platform as a Service. I hope this answers to your question. And to all my viewers, I really understand that this can be really tricky to answer these kind of questions because it's hard to remember each Azure service and what category it falls under. Is it under the category of PaaS or IAS or SaaS service? So to ease out your life, I have bought two links that you can refer to and they will help you a lot in recognizing the Azure services and the category they fall under. The first documentation that I have gotten for you is from Microsoft itself. And this is the page where they have listed all Azure products. You can see the categories here and if you will select one of the categories so let's select the azure database and if you will come to the database then you can see that azure sql database is given here so whenever you want to learn more about azure service then you can come back to this page and you can check out each microsoft azure service and which category they come under then a second great site that i have bought for you is this one and this one is azurecharts.com it's a brilliant site and it gives you a very neat mechanism of categorizing the service under pass or ias or sas offering let me show you how so, so this is the home page where you can see all the services are listed and if you will go to this drop down here you can see that you can now choose which category you want to see services from so let's choose pass category and now you can see that all the services are filtered out and only the services related to pass are shown. So now if you will see this SQL database, the Azure SQL database comes into the category of pass. And if you will select IAS. And now you can see the virtual machine comes under the category of infrastructure as a service. I hope that those two new links will surely help you categorizing Microsoft Azure services in right category. I hope my friends that you have noticed that these questions are related to the questions from earlier parts. So all of these questions are tagged with the question number and the part number they are attached or linked to. So if you want more details on these questions, then you can refer to the question number and the part number and watch that video again. Now let's move to question number 155. The question says that an Azure administrator plans to run PowerShell script that creates Azure resources. You need to recommend which computer configuration to use to run the script. The solution is 
run the script from a computer that run Mac OS and has PowerShell Core 6.0 installed. Does this meet the goal? Now the reason for picking this question in the bonus part is that this question was answered wrongly in our question number 30th in part 3 as yes. However, the correct answer for this question is no. My sincere apologies for that and a big thanks to the viewers who pointed out this mistake. Now let's see the other variation of the same question and try to find out the correct answer. So here we are on the question number 156. The question is same. However, the solution is that run the script from a computer that runs Mac OS and has PowerShell 7.0.6 LTS, PowerShell 7.1.3 or higher installed. Does this meet the goal? Now the correct answer is yes, this meets the goal. Now let me show you the Microsoft documentation to confirm our answers. So here we are on the Microsoft documentation that talks more about installing the Azure AZ PowerShell module. You can read this page more in detail. However, the most important section that I want to highlight is this one, which says that Azure PowerShell has no additional requirement when run on PowerShell 7.0.6 LTS and PowerShell 7.1.3 or higher. And that exactly justifies the answer given for question number 155 and question number 156. I hope you have noticed that 156 is a new question. That's why it's tagged as new. Now let's move to the question number 157. This one says that which Azure service should you use to collect events from multiple resources into a centralized repository? The correct answer for this question is Azure Event Hubs. The reason for picking this question is that one of our viewers was confused why I have not picked Azure Monitor. Now let me take you to the Microsoft site to answer this question better. So here I am on the Microsoft Azure site which talks more about Azure Event Hub. Now as you can read it says that a big data streaming platform and event ingestion service. Now if you remember the question it asked us to tell a service that can collect events from different sources or Azure services. Now we can see that Azure Event Hub, if you come down a little here, then here it says that Event Hub represents the front door of an event pipeline, often called as Event Ingester in solution architectures. So I hope you are understanding what an Event Hub is. So Event Hub is a service which enables you to ingest a lot of telemetry from the other Azure services. You can read more about Azure Event Hubs on this Microsoft page. All the links that I'm using in this presentation will be shared in description box below. Now coming to question number 158 and this says that you have a virtual machine named as VM1 that runs on Windows Server 2016. VM1 is in East US Azure region. Which Azure service should you use from Azure portal to view service failure notification that can affect availability of VM1? The options are Azure Service Fabric, Azure Monitor, Azure Virtual Machines or Azure Advisor. The correct answer for this question is Azure Monitor. The reason for picking Azure Monitor as an answer is that Azure Monitor helps you maximize availability and performance of your application and services. It delivers a comprehensive solution for collecting, analyzing, acting on telemetry from your cloud and on-premises environment. And you can read more about Azure Monitor capabilities on this page. And I really recommend you to watch this video here to fully understand what are the capabilities that Azure Monitor offers you. Now let's jump to the question number 159. The question says that your company's developer intend to deploy a large number of custom virtual machine on a weekly basis. They will also be removing these virtual machines during the same week it was deployed. 60% of the virtual machines have Windows Server 2016 installed while the other 40% has Ubuntu Linux installed. You are required to make sure that the administrative effort needed for this process is reduced by employing a suitable Azure service. The solution given here is you recommend the use of Microsoft Managed Desktop. 
does this meet the goal the correct answer for this question is no now the reason for picking this question for our bonus part is that one of our viewer asked that the presence of ubuntu linux in the question has made us decide not to choose microsoft managed desktop as an answer on this i want to tell you that the real ask of the question is to get an ability so that you can deploy a large number of virtual machines on weekly basis and then also remove this virtual machine during the same week so you are deploying virtual machines and removing them on a very rapid pace and the other key focus area is that you want to reduce the administrative effort needed for this process so this is the real ask of the question however there can be additional or i would say distractive parts as well in the question for example microsoft windows server here or ubuntu here so do not get distracted by these additional points in the question now to add a little more detail on microsoft managed desktop you can visualize microsoft managed desktop as a virtual laptop however it is managed by microsoft so you get to do all what you do on your normal laptop but this laptop or so to say virtual laptop is managed by microsoft you can read more about microsoft managed desktop i will share the links in the description box or you can also refer to the question number 25 in part 2 for more details on microsoft managed desktop now let's look at other two variations in question number 160 and question number 161 of the same question In question number 160 the solution given is that you recommend the use of azure reserve virtual machine does this solution meet the goal now you must understand that azure virtual machine as the name also suggests that you reserve a virtual machine for a larger horizon of time for example one year or three year and because of this upfront reservation microsoft gives you a huge discount in billing you can save as much as 72% on your cost as compared to the virtual machine in pay as you go pricing model however as your reserved virtual machine has nothing to do in deploying large number of custom virtual machines on a quick basis thus the correct answer for this question is no then we have question number 161 and now we have a option which says that you recommend the use of azure dev test labs The correct answer for this question is yes. So Azure Dev Test Lab gives you an ability where you can deploy a large number of custom virtual machine on a very quick basis. And that's the reason I have chosen a yes for this question. You can refer question number 2 in part 1 for more details on Azure Dev Test Lab. Now let's move to the question number 162. The question says that your developer have created 10 web application that must be host on Azure. You need to determine which Azure web tier plan to host the web apps. The web tier plan must meet the following requirement. The first requirement is that web apps will use custom domains. The web apps each require 10 GB of storage. The web app must each run in dedicated compute instances. load balancing between instances must be included and then we have cost must be minimized which web tier plan should you use should you use basic or developer or free or should you use standard the correct answer for this question is standard as that's the only web tier plan that best suit all these requirements the reason for picking this question in our bonus part is to highlight that the base for picking standard as a answer is not only the 10 gb of storage requirement for each web app but also to highlight that the maximum number of instances for the basic plan is 3 however our requirement is of 10 instances and that's also a reason for picking standard as a answer and i thank to the viewer who contributed this additional input and hopefully it adds to the overall understanding of all the viewers In case you want more details on different web tier plans then refer to the question number 5 in part 1 where i have compared all these web tier plans in quite some detail moving on we have question number 163 this one says a hybrid cloud is a part of public cloud the correct answer for this question is yes 
And the reason for picking this question for the bonus part is that one of viewer highlighted that he got the same question in his AZ-900 exam certification. And he was interested to know the correct answer for this question. And that's why this question is tagged as new. And I have mentioned this many times that hybrid cloud is a combination of public cloud and private cloud. Thus, definitely hybrid cloud is a part of public cloud. Also, in our previous 11 parts, we have covered a lot of variations of this question. So let me bring them as well so that we have full coverage of all the variations. So we have question number 164 and in this question, it says an organization that hosts its infrastructure dash no longer requires data center. So you have to choose between private cloud, hybrid cloud, public cloud or Hyper-V host. And we all know now that the correct answer for this question is public cloud because in private cloud of course the organizations have their own data center in hybrid cloud as i already mentioned that it's a combination of public cloud and private cloud and of course hyper v is not related to any of the cloud model thus the correct answer is public cloud then we have question number 165 and this says that in which type of cloud model are all hardware resources owned by third party and shared between multiple tenants the correct answer for this question is also public cloud so now let's move to the question number 166 which will be the last question for our part 12 bonus q a session however there will be one more part 13 where i have covered more of your doubts and questions so let's move to the question number 166. It says that to which cloud models can you deploy physical servers? Is it public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud and public cloud? Or is it hybrid cloud only? Or is it private cloud and hybrid cloud? Now pay attention that the question is asking that in which cloud model can you deploy your physical server? It can also ask that in which cloud model can you have your own data center? So Microsoft can really tweak the language in the questions. So be very careful whenever you are reading the question. Coming to the question, the correct answer for this one is private cloud and hybrid cloud. In both these cloud models, you can deploy your own physical servers. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning. Your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and I look forward for them. We will meet again in our next video. Till then, stay fit, keep learning and thanks for watching. Hello and welcome back to the Tech Blackboard. In recent times, many of my viewers have passed AZ-900 certification exams with great scores. A big congratulations to all of you. And I am grateful to all of you who shared some of the latest topics and sections from where the questions came in the recent AZ-900 examination. Based on those valuable inputs, today we are going to cover 25 questions in part 13 and out of which 24 questions are absolutely new. And I am pretty sure that these new questions will surely help the new Azure enthusiasts in their upcoming certification exams. And for those who are first time today here, a quick mention that a total of 191 questions are covered in this AZ-900 real exam question and answer series. Please do cover all the previous parts before appearing in your AZ-900 certification exam to greatly boost your scores. All the questions are very well explained and supported by proper Microsoft documentation. There are so many tips and tricks throughout the series that will immensely increase your cloud understanding. A great way to appreciate my work and effort is to give me a like and press that subscribe button. Do not miss to press that bell icon so that you don't miss any notification for our upcoming AZ-104 real exam question and answer series. Here is a quick mention of our numbering convention used in bonus part. In case the question in the bonus part is connected to any of the previous 11 parts, then the earlier connected question and the part it was published in will be available in this blue tag on the right corner of that question. And in case you want greater detail on this question, do check out the previously linked question published in this part. Moving ahead, if the question is absolutely new, then it will be just marked by the new tag.
Let's begin our part 13 with question number 167. The question says that what should you use in Microsoft Sentinel to see visualization of an incident with related to alert and entities? Your options are workbook, analytics rule, connector or investigation graph. The key sections that you want to notice is that we want to see visualization of an incident with related to alerts and entities. Now let's go to the Microsoft documentation to read and find the correct answer for this question. Here is the Microsoft documentation which talks more about investigate incident with Microsoft Sentinel. Please note that Azure Sentinel is now called Microsoft Sentinel. Now in the very first paragraph you can read that this article helps you investigate incident with Microsoft Sentinel. After you connected your data sources to Microsoft Sentinel you want to be notified when something suspicious happens. To enable you to do this, Microsoft Sentinel lets you create advanced alert rules that generate incidents that you can assign and investigate. This article covers investigate incidents and then you can see we have use investigation graph and then we can respond to threats. Now here the important keywords that you want to notice are that we are talking about investigation graph and we are also talking about it lets you create advanced alert rules. And that's exactly what our question is asking that we want to visualize an incidents and also the alerts and entities. So the correct answer for this question is investigation graph. Now let's move to the question number 168. It talks about again Azure Sentinel and it says that Azure Sentinel or Microsoft Sentinel use playbook to your options are monitor Azure service, maintain security certificates, run PowerShell scripts or automatically respond to threats. The correct answer for this question is automatically respond to threats. If you want to know the logic behind selection of option B, then you need to check out question number 142 in part 11. Now let's move to the question number 169. This one says that which IoT solution is high security microcontroller and Linux based application in Azure. Is it IoT Hub or IoT Central or is it Azure Sphere? The correct answer for this question is Azure Sphere. Now let's go to the Microsoft site to validate our answer. Now this is the Microsoft documentation talking more about Azure Sphere. You can read in the first paragraph itself that Azure Sphere is a secured high level application platform with built in communication and security features for internet connected devices. It comprises a secured connected crossover multi-controller unit MCU, a custom high level Linux based operating system and a cloud based security service that provide continuous renewable security. I hope you have already noticed the keywords microcontroller and Linux based operating system. Before jumping to the PPT, I want to show you one more page that you can come and read more about Azure Sphere. This is a great page where you can learn more about Azure Sphere. From the Microsoft documentation, we learned that Azure Sphere is an IoT solution which is high security microcontroller and Linux based application. So thus our answer to this question is correct. Now let's move to the question number 170. It says that a VM can be deployed to multiple resources group. Is it yes or is it no? The correct answer is no. You cannot deploy same virtual machine to multiple resource group. You can move a virtual machine from one resource group to another. However, same virtual machine cannot exist in two resource group at the same time. And this is not only true for the virtual machine, but all other resources in Azure as well. So you cannot have the same resource in multiple resource groups. Please like the video if you're enjoying the content so far. And if you're new here, please do subscribe. Now let's move to the question number 171. This is a yes no kind of question. So let's read the first statement. The first statement says most Azure services are introduced in private preview before being introduced in public preview and then in general availability. Now this is the documentation from Microsoft that talks more about the life cycle of any Azure service. If you will scroll down a little here you can read more about the service life cycle and it clearly says that every Azure service starts in a development phase 
In this phase, the Azure team collects and defines its requirement and begins to build the service. Once this development is done, then the next is that the service is released to the public preview phase. And post this public preview phase, you can read here that after a Azure service has been validated and tested, it is released to all the customer as production ready service. This is known as general availability. And that documentation from Microsoft clearly matches with this statement. So the correct answer for this statement is yes. Moving on with the second statement, we have Azure services in public preview can be managed only by using Azure CLI. The correct answer for this statement is no. You can manage Azure services in public preview not only using Azure CLIs, there are a lot of other options as well. For example, Azure Portal, PowerShell, API and many more. Thus, the correct answer is no. Then the third statement says the cost of an Azure service in private preview decrease when the service become generally available. The correct answer for this statement is no. So this statement is wrong because the cost of Azure service does not decrease when it comes to general availability. Moving on with question number 172, which again is a yes no kind of question. And let's read the first statement. The first statement says that the trust center is a part of Azure security center. The correct answer for this statement is no. The second statement says that the trust center can only be accessed by user that have an Azure subscription. The correct answer for this statement is again a no. And the reason for this is that trust center is an open site or open Microsoft documentation and anyone can read through. So you don't have to have a Azure subscription to read through or access the trust center. Then the third statement says that the trust center provide information about Azure compliance offering. The correct answer for this statement is yes, it does. So trust center is a Microsoft site where it gives a lot of information about the Microsoft or Azure compliance offerings. If you want to read more about Microsoft Trust Center, then this is the website where you can come in. And as you can see, I'm not logged in and still I can access this website. So this means that it is an open website and anyone can read through. And as always, you will find the link for this documentation in the description box. Coming to the question number 173, a yes, no kind of question. We read the first statement. It says that general data protection regulation or better known as GDPR defines data protection and privacy rules. The correct answer for this statement is yes. Then in the second statement, we have GDPR applies to companies that offer goods or services to individual in EU. The correct answer for this statement is again a yes. So GDPR applies whenever you're dealing with any individual or company with EU specific data. So keep that point in mind. Then we have third statement, which says that Azure can be used to build a GDPR compliant infrastructure. And the answer is of course a yes. If you want to get started with Azure GDPR and what are its capabilities, then this is a great page to come and read more about Azure GDPR. Now let's move to the question number 174. This question requires that we need to evaluate the underlying text to determine if it is correct. So let's read the entire statement. It says that from Azure Monitor, you can view which user turned off a specific virtual machine during the last 14 days. So the instruction given for the question is that you have to review this underlying text. And if you think that this statement or this Azure service makes this entire statement correct, then you have to choose no change needed. However, if you think that this service does not fit this statement, then you have to choose between three of these services given in option B, C and D. The correct answer for this statement is Azure Activity Log. So if you are looking for the logs on a virtual machine, for example, who turned it off, then Azure Activity Log is the place to go and not Azure Monitor. We have talked a lot about Azure Monitor in our previous 12 parts. I encourage you to watch those videos and you will get a lot of questions and understanding on Azure Monitor. This is an important topic and many questions come related to Azure Monitor. 
So please do not skip any of the previous videos. Now let's read out our question number 175. This question says that you need to require to evaluate the underlying text to determine if it is correct. So this is the underlying text. The entire sentence is that Azure keyword is used to store app secrets. Now what you need to do is you need to see if Azure keyword fits this statement or not. If it fits, then you have to choose no change needed. If it doesn't fit this statement, then you have to figure out which of these Azure service will fit in this statement. Now the correct answer for this question is no change needed. Most definitely Azure Keyword is used to store app secrets. Now there can be one more variation of the same question where the Microsoft can ask that Azure Keyword is used to store instead of app secrets, it might ask you user secrets. In that case, this statement becomes wrong because Azure Keyword is not used to store user secrets. It is used to store app secrets. So in case you get this variation where it says user secrets, then now you know the answer. Now let's move to the question number 176. This is again a yes no kind of question. So let's read the first statement. The first statement says that you can use Azure cost management to view cost associated to management groups. The correct answer for this statement is yes. Then the second statement says that you can use Azure cost management to view cost associated to resource group. The correct answer for this statement is also a yes. The third statement says that you can use Azure cost management to view the usage of virtual machine during the last three months. The correct answer for this statement is yes as well. If you want to read more about cost management and billing, then this is the Microsoft documentation where you can get started. Now let's move to the question number 177. The question says that your company plans to migrate all on-premise data to Azure. You need to identify whether Azure complies with the company's regional requirement. What should you use? Your options are the Knowledge Center, Azure Marketplace, My Apps Portal, or the Trust Center. The correct answer for this question is the trust center. Now let me take you to the Microsoft documentation where we can read more about trust center. So here I am on the Microsoft trust center portal and you can see that it says that our mission is to empower everyone to achieve more and we build our products and services with security, privacy, compliance and transparency in mind. So you can already see that this page is primarily divided into three major section. One is security, other one is privacy, and the third one is compliance. So if you want to read more about compliance, and that's exactly what our question also asked, local compliance or compliance at broader level, then you can come and read onto this page. The other two sections are equally important. Security, of course, this is built in all Microsoft services, then privacy is an important aspect whenever we are talking about the data. So I encourage you to come to this page and understand all the three concepts that comes under Microsoft Trust Center. Moving on with the question number 178. This one says that Azure policy helps organization to enforce organizational standards and to access compliance at scale, or does it help you to create security policy or it helps you to create firewall rules. This is the Microsoft documentation page, which gives more detail on Azure policy. Reading through the first line, we have Azure policy helps you to enforce organizational standards and to access compliance at scale. Keep this line in mind, organizational standards and to access compliance at scale, because that's exactly what our question is also asking for. So the correct answer for this question is option A, enforce organizational standards and to access compliance at scale. Moving on with the question number 179. Here we have an Azure cost management service allows customer to estimate the cost of running their on-prem solution on Azure services before making a purchase. Is that statement true? The correct answer is no. So it's not Azure cost management that enables you to estimate the cost before even making a purchase. The correct service that does that is 
total cost of ownership calculator. So this is the page where you can read more on total cost of ownership calculator. And if you will read the very first line, it says estimate cost saving you can realize by migrating your workloads to Azure. So total cost of ownership gives you an ability where you can estimate the cost which you have to incur when you move your solution to Azure Cloud. And that's why no is the suitable answer. Moving on with question number 180. It says that you can improve composite SLA by adding redundant service to your application. And the correct answer for this question is yes. Of course, when you add a redundant service, then it gives you a better and improved SLA. The next question we have is 181. It says that you can access compliance manager from Azure Active Directory Admin Center, Azure Portal, Microsoft 365 Compliance Center, or Azure Service Trust Portal, where from you can access the compliance manager. To better find the answer, let's go to the Microsoft documentation. Now here we are on the Microsoft documentation that talks more about Microsoft Compliance Manager. And on the very first line, you can read that Microsoft Compliance Manager is a feature in Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. It also says that Compliance Manager helps you manage your organization's compliance requirement with greater ease and convenience. But I hope you have noticed that Compliance Manager is a feature in Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. And that's exactly what our answer is as well. Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. Now let's move to the question number 182. This question says that North America is represented by a single Azure region. So do you think that North America has only one single Azure region? The correct answer is no. So North America has several Azure regions, including West US, Central US, South Central US, East US and Canada East. So it has multiple Azure region and that's why we have selected no. Then we move on to question number 183. This question says that which service provides network traffic filtering across multiple Azure subscription and virtual networks. Options given are Azure Key Vault, Azure Firewall and Azure Security Group or Azure Trust Portal. The correct answer for this question is Azure Firewall. Now let's move to the question number 184. It says if you set permission to an Azure resource group, all the Azure resources in that resource group inherit the permission. The correct answer is yes. The reason being that whenever you have Azure resource group and there are multiple resources inside that resource group. So if you set a permission on a resource group level, then it actually descends or it is inherited by all the resources in that resource group. So keep that small tip in mind. Now further we have question number 185, a yes no kind of question. Let's read out the first statement. The first statement says that one Microsoft account can be used to maintain multiple Azure subscription. The correct answer is of course yes. So you can have multiple subscription under one Microsoft account. The second statement says that two Azure subscriptions can be merged into a single subscription by creating a support request. The correct answer is no. You cannot merge two subscription in Azure. Then we have the third statement which says a company can store resources in multiple subscription. The correct answer is yes. Of course, you can store resources in multiple subscription. So you can create subscription as per your need. Always remember that the Azure billing is always associated with Azure subscription. So for example, if you want to create a subscription for your HR department or you want to create a subscription for your finance department so that you can track the expense that these department are incurring on Azure resource. So that's how you can manage different resources in different Azure subscription. Now let's move to the question number 186. It says that you created multiple new subscription, then a virtual machine can be moved to new subscription. So exactly what question is asking you is let's suppose that you have a virtual machine and you have two Azure subscription, subscription A and subscription B, and you have this virtual machine in subscription A. So can you move this virtual machine from subscription A to subscription B? 
The correct answer is yes. Yes, you can move a virtual machine from one subscription to another subscription. Now let's jump to the question number 187. It says that Azure Key Vault automatically generates a new secret after every use. The correct answer for this question is no. So Azure Key Vault does not generate a new secret after every use. That's why we have chosen a no here. Now let's move to the question number 188. The question says that you plan to deploy several Azure virtual machines. You need to control the ports that devices on the internet can use to access virtual machines. What should you use? Your options are a network security group or NSG, an Azure Active Directory, a network gateway or Azure Key Vault. The correct answer for this question is a network security group. To properly justify the answer, let me take you to the Microsoft documentation. So this is the page that talks more about network security groups. It says that you can use a Azure network security group to filter network traffic to and from Azure resources in Azure virtual network. It says further that Azure security group contains security rules that allow or deny inbound network traffic or outbound network traffic from several type of Azure resources. If you remember, our question talked about the ability to control the ports. And that's exactly what the next line says, that for each rule, you can specify source and destination, port and protocol. And that documentation from Microsoft justify our answer. Moving on with the question number 189, it says that your Azure environment contains multiple Azure virtual machines. You need to ensure that a virtual machine named the Tech Blackboard VM1 is accessible from internet over HTTP. The solution given here is that you modify DDoS protection plan. Does this meet the goal? Now let's check out one more variation of the same question. Here in question number 190, the question is same. However, the solution is different. This time it says that you modify an Azure traffic manager profile. So does this meet the goal? The correct answer for question number 189 is no and 190 is also no. This is because if you want to ensure that a virtual machine named the Tech Blackboard VM1 is accessible from internet over HTTP, then in that case, you have to modify either network security group or Azure Firewall. Thus, both the option Azure Traffic Manager Profile and DDoS Protection Plan are not correct. If you want to read more about Azure DDoS protection, then you can come on this page. And if you want to have more insights on Azure Traffic Manager, then this is the page that you can refer. The links for all the Microsoft documentation that I have referred in this video are available in the description box below. Now let's move to the question number 191. Friends, this is the last question for our AZ900 real exam question and answer series. So far, we have covered 191 questions in 13 parts. And I would strongly recommend you watching all these parts before you appear in the Microsoft AZ900 examination. Also, as Microsoft keeps changing the question, I will also be releasing more parts in the coming times so that you are updated with the latest questions. So don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you are not missing the latest update on Microsoft AZ900 examination. Now let's read out question number 191. It says that your company plans to deploy several web servers and several database servers to Azure. You need to recommend an Azure solution to limit the types of connection from web server to the database server. What should you include in the recommendation? Your options are network security group, Azure service bus, a local network gateway or a route filter. The correct answer for this question is network security groups. I hope you enjoyed this series on AZ900 real exam question and answers. Once again, a big thanks to all of you viewers who truly supported me throughout this series. And do not miss to subscribe to the channel and press that bell icon as a brand new series on AZ104 real exam question and answer series is to be launched very soon. And you don't want to miss any notification on that series. If this video has added any value in your learning, a like and subscribe is highly appreciated. Share this video in your family and friends to spread and expand their learning.
your comments and feedback give me a chance to interact with you and i look forward for them we will meet again in our next video till then stay fit keep learning and thanks for watching